will look back at it, all the surface level stuff, they'll try to replicate it and think that that's the reason that it went viral, but they won't look at the real reason why it went viral, which was. I think we're live. Uh, so welcome to whatever this is that I'm recording. Um, this is a conversation between me and Gerard Tam, who actually prefers to go by Jerry Tam. So just a heads up on that. Um, Jerry, I'll give a little bit of introduction and then I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Um, Jerry is the founder of Gerard Media, which is based out of Sydney, Australia. They do video production for brands and businesses in the area, uh, among other things. But um, I'm not really good at these introductions, so I'll pass it over. Jerry, do you want to give a, a little bit of uh, background on who you are, what you do, what you're working on, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, like like you said, I, I go by Jerry. I think it's easier to remember and uh, I can't live up to the name Gerard, Gerard Butler sometimes because that's, a, that's quite a man right there, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, but yeah, so I, I run Gerard Media based out of Sydney and uh, basically I do video marketing and video production. So I try to position myself more as a consultant and I like doing more of the consulting strategic type work. So that's what I focus on with the addition of the production and the execution on the on the back end. Um, so yeah, that's primarily what I do. And um, yeah, I guess there's two types of videos that I do for for business owners and brands, which is kind of your longer form story driven video, um, telling people who you are, what you do, why you do what you do, how you're different. Um, some other story driven stuff like client stories. And then the other type of video I do is like your short form social media, micro content and stuff like that. So those are the two things that I focus on in my business. And, um, those are the two things that I help my clients with at the moment. Cool. So the point of this interview, um, for context, I'll just paint some context here. Um, Jerry, you and I have had a couple of these calls where there's there's no record button. It's just me and you talking. And we talk for hours about building business, about building uh, a brand, about the systems that we use. And we already have these conversations because this is just stuff that we enjoy talking about. Um, I thought it would be a good opportunity to record one of these conversations uh, because I want to learn from you about how you built up your Instagram. So for context, Jerry runs a full-time business. He is a full-time creator uh, working for brands and businesses, but he's also built up his Instagram to, uh, I think, a little over 100,000 followers. Is that right? Um, yeah. We're, we're going to dig into that. Like, I want to know kind of how that happened, why it happened, um, what were some of the tactics and strategies you use there. Um, but before I dig into that, remind me how old you are again? 27. 27. Yes. So 27, um, building an entire business, which is like difficult enough as it is building the content for other brands, um, but then also building your own brand. And we've talked a little bit about where you're looking to take things. We'll, we'll dig into a little bit of that. Uh, I just want to say like, that's amazing. I think it's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to learn from you about this stuff. So um, tell me a little bit firstly about your background. Give me kind of like the high level of what you did kind of before video production, what got you into it, and uh, what that process looked like for you. Yeah, for sure. So um, my love for video kind of started on really early. And it started in Hong Kong when I would spend, you know, all my weekends skating, skateboarding with my friends. And a big part of the skate culture is filming stuff, right? It's this NBD culture, never been done culture. If, if you don't do it on camera, it's never been done. So um, I always would spend time on the weekends skating, hitting the streets with my friends, trying to capture our tricks with, with video. And um, yeah, none of us really wanted to hold the camera, right? <laughs> we all wanted to be doing the, doing the tricks. So eventually it kind of fell on me to, to do the filming and I just enjoyed being kind of a support system as well. And I eventually stopped uh, skating myself and I eventually became the filmer because I enjoyed creating the videos. I enjoyed capturing the moments, the adventures, you know, running from security, capturing these crazy tricks down these, you know, 10 stair rails and, and stuff like that. Um, so I eventually became the filmer and that's how I kind of fell in love with video. But um, I kind of put that to the side for, for a little while because, you know, you, you go to college and 
you don't have time to do the stuff that you once loved and um, you spend most of your time studying. So I went to college in Boston. I went to Northeastern University and you know, when you go to college, you kind of have an idea of what you want to do. My idea was marketing. I thought, you know, I'm a creative person and I want to make money. So the perfect intersection there is, is doing a marketing degree. And uh, yeah, there's kind of, I guess, three options in marketing that I didn't realize I had until later on in, in after I graduated or midway through college, at least, um, which was you could do agency so you could do agency side marketing, ad agency, things like that. You could do marketing in-house. Um, so this could be for just general corporate or you could do small business. And uh, luckily for me, even though I didn't, I feel like I didn't learn a lot of marketing in actual classrooms. I learned a lot of marketing through this program that my school had, which is the co-op program. So I'm sure there's other universities that have a co-op program. I don't know if you've heard of this, this concept, yeah. um, but essentially, Throughout my curriculum, uh, our curriculum, anyone that's at Northeastern, they can opt to do two to three semesters of paid internships, like intensive, long-term, six months at a time internships. Um, so that was really cool because it gave me an opportunity, opportunity to actually be in the trenches of marketing and see, kind of test out what I liked. So yeah, my first internship, I did agency, which was cool. I learned a lot. But as a lot of people may know or may have heard of, agency culture is, is not the greatest. And uh, yeah, I soon, I soon found out that the, the culture just wasn't right for me. It was a lot of um, like labeling. Like if you, I always think about those old high school TV shows and high school movies where you have the jocks and the nerds and the mean, the mean group, the mean girls and the, and the cool kids. It was kind of like that. Um, but on steroids and as growing ass humans as well, which I thought was crazy. Um, so I didn't enjoy that. Uh, so my second internship, I decided to try in-house. So I did in-house at Reebok in Boston, Mass, which is actually their headquarters. Nice. And nice. the culture was amazing. I love the culture. People were really kind and everyone was trying to help each other up. But I was so low down in the in the food chain that I felt like I wasn't actually doing anything meaningful or creating any impact or really even learning that much. Um, so at the end of uh, college, when I graduated, I realized there's one thing left I have to try, which is small business. So I went back to Hong Kong and I signed up to be a marketing manager at a local boxing fitness club. And that was really cool because I got to experience what it's like to be a marketer actually in the trenches, in the weeds, doing Facebook ads, creating content. I got to pick up a video camera again, which kind of sparked my curiosity um, into video again. And the culture was great. People were fun. Um, but I was not getting paid as much as I wanted to get paid. <laughs> so yeah. I kind of felt like, I did everything at that point. I did agency, I did in-house, and I did a small business. The last, last kind of thing that I didn't really expect or think about was to just try and start something for myself and start my own business. So, I, you know, one day I quit and I just decided to ship myself over to Sydney. Sydney, my girlfriend was studying there at the time, and I thought it was a perfect opportunity to start fresh and, and start my own video or content agency business i didn't know what it was going to be but that's where i am today so yeah that's kind of the okay background. okay so a uh, bit of marketing background you guys to test out the waters agency uh working for a big company and then smaller company um what was it about the uh, like working for the smaller kind of like um local business that uh because i i know that that's you work with a lot of those clients now well a whole range but like um there was some there had to have been something about the smaller size that was attractive to you where it's like, there's actually like, there's a lot of impact here that I can make, but I'm making it for someone else. What if I made that same impact for my own little local business? Um, what, what was that like? What, like what attracted you to that? Yeah, I guess. So what attracted me to the, to the local business in the first place? Um, well, first it was the idea that that was kind of the last option if I were to try marketing and test everything out was small business because I did kind of the two other versions of, of becoming a marketer. 
So that was the initial interest. I'm a boxer. Like I, I'm not a professional boxer. I don't fight in the ring, but I like I like boxing as a hobby and staying fit and stuff like that. Um, so it was just kind of a cool opportunity that came up when I joined a boxing gym in Hong Kong. And uh, yeah, I thought you know they probably need help with their with their content. They probably need help with their marketing. And I just talked to the to the owner at the time because um, we're in the same vicinity like he's there by the desk and I was there in the classes and we kind of struck up a conversation and it just started from there um, but I guess yeah I just I just really wanted to be in the trenches as I said learning actual marketing tactic and and technique and not just thinking about the theoretical stuff that I learned that I quote unquote learn in in, in school um, yeah. So that was kind of the main attraction for me was the the ability to actually be hands on with the with the marketing that I was doing. Sweet. And so from the stuff that you learn from all of those different uh, different facets of marketing, different implementations, different size businesses, um, how much of that translated into like something that you could use? for your own business, like to grow your own business. Um, is there any kind of key things that you learned at, at those steps where you're like, actually, I can take that and use that concept for me to grow that for me? Yeah. So it's actually funny. The um, first month, I think, that I started with them, I picked up the camera again because at the time, content was big. There was a lot of educational content being put out by, especially in the fitness space. And I was like, we, we're not doing any of this. We're, we're going to fall behind. So I decided to pick up the camera and just do some tips, like some five tips to improve your jab, five tips to improve your boxing technique. And I remember the first, literally the first video I created for them. It was one of those old ones where you have the, it was, it was square one by one and then you have the the text the big bold text at the top and then what's going the captions at the bottom um so that old style of of micro content if you will uh but i created that for the first video and it kind of went semi-viral for the size of their audience and they got a nice. lot of dms and got a lot of interest which was really cool so um that was my first kind of that was the first seed that planted in my head that content kind of works especially video content if it's done in a specific way and uh, so yeah i did a lot more of that and we were able to grow our following steadily and bring in a little bit more business um but there was one thing specifically that i did for them i did a facebook ad campaign uh for one of their their sister businesses they were relaunching in a different location and i was kind of spearheading that that rebrand and relaunch and uh for the first three months we were running a Facebook ad campaign which was just like a hero video that I did with the trainers showing the personality showing the experience of of the boxing classes and uh, using some testimonials at the same time too and this was me just like kind of throwing strategies together that I've heard of on the internet not really going in with any specific proven strategy um, yeah. and surprisingly it did insanely well so we ran the campaign and it brought in, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers of impressions and stuff. It must have been like over 100,000 impressions in a couple of weeks. Um, but a lot of impressions, a lot of interest, and we booked up our classes for the first two to three months of our, our relaunch. When before we had, I don't know, like four to five people per class. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty insane. And that was my first insight into how um, direct response worked. So that was really awesome. cool. And I've taken kind of all those skills and I, I guess I took all those skills and, and ran with them into into my own business. So um, I don't yeah, do much amazing. direct response anymore, but I guess the, the thought process behind how to create a successful ad and successful content kind of has stuck with me since then, yeah. So I did a little bit of direct response marketing as well. And one of the things that I learned throughout that was um, we could take something that was like beautifully produced and like high spec, like, and we could throw that, we could throw money at that. But the thing that actually worked was if it looked a little bit more um, organic and if it looked organic and if, if it had a good story to it, and then we put money behind that, those were the ads that like really took off. Uh, pairing that also with like testimonials and stuff like that. Um, and 
that is a, it was such a fascinating learning for me because I thought like, okay, the higher spec ad is definitely going to win because more money, more time, more effort went into it. But then it starts to look almost like a, like a, like a movie trailer rather than like something that is attainable for someone to actually go do and be a part of. Um, but it was, it's really cool that you were able to take that skill, um, all those learnings and then transfer that into your own business, which, uh, as, as you know, (laughs) when you do that, you now get control over the clients, you get control over the, the revenue, the income coming in, and you can kind of lead that to where you want that to go. Um, this is one thing, like if I've learned like one big thing from uh, taking my experience in marketing and, and these other areas and bringing them to, to what I'm doing today is that if you know a little bit, like for, for a big client and you apply that little bit to what you are doing, you go so much further. Like, mm. like yeah. if you just have like a little, like 10% of the skills over here is like almost like a hundred percent of the skills over here. So, um, I tell my friends that are like still in marketing and in their careers all the time. I'm like, you would crush it on your own. Like you, you would go, you could make a business almost out of anything. If you just took those skills that you're using to grow this big, big chain and use it for your own little thing, you would dominate. Um, but I think it's, yeah. it's hard for people to, uh, make that connection sometimes. So, yeah, yeah. Same, same for me, man. Like, I've uh, my sister is actually in branding in uh, in corporate, so she's working for a branding firm. And sometimes I talk to her. I'm like, man, you would make a killing if you just went went out on your own and you did this for for yourself for other businesses. But uh, you know, some people love their job. Some people love where they're at yeah. right now, and yeah. you know, they're they're happy with where they're at. So I'm not gonna project my my ideas of what could be better on them. So yeah, yeah I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, totally agree. Um, okay. So I, I can talk to you all day about how you grew the video business. Um, we, we've talked about this before and I think it's super impressive what you've been able to do. The, uh, thing that I want to focus on on this call is more around the personal brand of, of what you've built. So, um, Let's just kind of talk about the results real quick. So I already alluded it, 100,000 um, Instagram followers, which is just like, that's mind blowing to me when I visualize how many people that is. Um, but the important thing to talk about in the results is also uh, you, do, you don't have like hundreds or thousands of videos that you, you put out. You have like a concentrated um, effort in in the in the video so you were able to reach that hundred thousand in kind of record time from what i've seen and record um like effort going into it not in like herculean effort i mean like record as in like very high roi for each video that you put out had a significant impact on the growth of your uh your instagram page so um hundred thousand followers how long did that take you I want to preface this by saying like, well, I've had an Instagram for like eight years. That's not what I mean. I mean, like from the minute that you decided I'm going to, I'm going to take this seriously to hitting a hundred K, how long was that? Yeah. I mean, that's a funny thing. Cause I was thinking about this the other day, because when I did the post about my hundred K, it did come off as an overnight success. Cause I literally grew from four to a hundred K in a month in 30 days yeah. when I look back yeah. at it, which, yeah, when you're looking at the surface, that does actually, if someone were to say you're an overnight success, that does actually sound like it, but I'd actually been creating content previously for, I think around two years at that point before that. Yeah. And I grew from zero to around three K after a year of posting content, I believe. Okay. And, uh, that took a lot of effort and took a lot of figuring out things as I went. And I honestly didn't have any specific strategy. All I knew at the time was social media is a way to generate leads and content is a way to do that. So my initial idea was to create content to generate leads. Um, So I did that for about a year and then I kind of got distracted by other shiny objects. One of those shiny objects was uh, video outreach, which, you know, an- another thing we could talk about all day. Um, but I kind of paused that because, you know, I had to pay the bills. So I couldn't really 
justify spending a ton of time on content that wasn't actually generating any return in terms of, you know, uh, financial return. So yeah. I paused for a little bit, I think maybe like six months. And I generated a lot of business through doing the outreach and stuff, which was cool. And I filled out my business and I was doing pretty well. So when I filled up the business, I kind of put content on hold and um, I didn't get back into it until uh, 2022. So okay. I got back into it 2022 just because content kind of picked up and everyone was doing it. And I thought, you know, like, I might as well be doing it now that I have a little bit more more time. And it, it wasn't necessarily to, to really generate leads, but it was more so about the personal brand. I'd heard things about building your personal brand and um, trying to build some sort of authority online. So it was less about lead gen and more so about authority the second time around. Yeah. And uh, in 2022, I was able to grow from like 3K to 4K pretty quickly. And I was like, all right, I'm getting feedback here. It's not taking as long and my content is getting the, the recognition that I want. And I just kept at it, at it. And one day, I think it was November 2022, one of my videos reached like one mil in one mil views in a couple of days, like maybe four, four days Crazy. or something like that, which like, man, I can't, I can't even imagine like getting 10,000 views on a video, let alone like a million in a couple of days. So that was crazy to me. And I got all the notifications, like, like it was crazy. And looking back on it, I know I was putting in the effort in terms of my messaging that eventually it was going to hit. It was just a matter of time. So that's how I was committed. That's how committed I was to, I guess, the consistency of, of posting um, but yeah, that, that video kind of brought up the rest of my videos and all together brought me from, I think that 4k at that time to hundred K in, in that 30 days, which was insane. So yeah, I guess on the surface, yes, it looks like you see the headline hundred K to uh, zero to hundred K in 30 days, but there was a lot of effort and learning and failing on the back end yeah. prior to that. So yeah, that was kind of the process. Yeah. So the the thing I love about your story and like how, how it evolves, because I, I kind of know what comes next and, and we'll dig into that. But the thing that I, I want to highlight, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but in the beginning, it was more like, I know there's something here. I know like it could be good for my business. So I'm going to get on social media. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post content. I'm just going to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks, right? Like I'm just going to, uh, you know, try different things. And after a while, it can be pretty easy to get discouraged when you don't get that feedback, when you don't like see the growth. Um, but even more importantly, as a business owner, when it doesn't equate into sales. And this is something that I think I, I see a lot of creatives doing, like a lot of um, video business owners or photographers, um, they, they post content to attract the leads. And this is something I, I did as well for a little while, but then I, I really quickly realized the people that were engaging with the content were not potential leads. They were like potential friends or like other creatives that were like, oh, nice shots. I'm like, nah, that's, you're not who I'm trying to reach here. <laughs> um, and it, it took me a long while, a long time to kind of understand it, at least for me, um, the decision makers at the companies that would hire me maybe weren't on Instagram or they weren't like looking at Instagram the same way that I was like putting the content there for like that, like there was a bit of a disconnect. And then, um, much like yourself, I was like, okay, well, I still can create content. I have a camera. Is there any other way that I can create content to, to maybe get a better result? And that's when I discovered the outreach and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll just record myself doing the exact same thing, but I'll put it directly in someone's inbox who would be the decision maker at the company. And then like my first day of doing it, I was like, oh, I have meetings lined up. Like this is a much better use of my time as the business owner at, at this point, um, at this stage. Um, it sounds like that was a pretty similar realization for you. Um, is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, the so the video outreach was just the return on time invested was just so monumental and yeah. it, translated to sales it translated to yeah. money in the bank account for me at the beginning content didn't 
do that for me. So the second time around when I refocused my perspective on why I'm creating content was more so, hey, I have a little bit of time now. I don't really have to worry about bills too much because I have this other method that I'm bringing business in. Why don't I spend time developing authority, which was kind of my, my mindset was, it was a positioning play for me. It was a yep. positioning play because yep. I was trying to shift to that consultant role. Right. So yeah, and this is important. Um, before we dig into the next stuff, I just want to kind of uh, chew on this a little bit because I do think social media is very, very powerful. I think it can be um, extremely beneficial for, for any business. But I, I think the intention that you go in with it is very important. And um, I, I'm kind of going through a similar transition myself. So uh, when I post content on Instagram or somewhere else, I'm not looking for the direct like, okay, this needs to lead to sales. Okay, this needs to lead to a lead. Um, I, I'm, I'm way past that. But what I do think is important is that you can build authority so that peop you, you can start to become known for something. And eventually that could turn into something, but taking away the direct like, my hour making content needs to equal to this many sales. Um, removing that equation made it a lot easier for me to, to to do it and to invest the time. I think social media and building up the authority, building up the brand, I think it's a long-term play. And in the beginning of a business, you might not have that like long-term, you'd be like, no, I gotta make money. <laughs> so, um, but once you are making money and things are going things are running and they're going smoothly. I think it's a very important thing to still to, to go back to that and be like, okay, now I'm going to take this seriously, but under a different strategy, which is, it sounds like what you're doing. Um, okay. So a couple more questions I want to ask you on this. So you went back the second time with a different strategy, with a different, um, a, a, a different understanding of what you're trying to do, a different outcome that you're trying to reach. Um, how did that change your strategy about what you talked about or how you talked about it. What kind of shifted there the second stab with uh, creating content? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I want to I wanna let that marinate a little before I answer. Um, so yeah, as you said, the first time around, my end goal was lead gen. And I realized that was probably not the most efficient way to approach it because there are other higher return on a return on time invested activities that you could do, higher leverage activities you could do. The second time around, what actually changed in terms of strategy and in terms of end goal was I, well, one, I changed to just showing up. Like I, changed my outcome or end goal to just showing up consistently and mm. whatever comes as a byproduct of that was great was great so strategically in terms of like showing up on the back end that's what it looked like but in terms of what i talked about that meant i had to speak a little broader so i remember we were having this conversation before which was at the beginning, I was talking a lot of business terms, how to use video to get more sales, how to use video to um, automate your business, very business internal specific things that I thought because I was speaking to my ideal client, which is business owners, I thought I had to speak that way in order to, yeah. to generate the leads, right? And to get the attention of the business owners. The second time around, I had to go broader because I was like, I want to reach more people. It doesn't matter who they are, but I want to build authority and I want to build some like to some degree. I want I do want to build my following a little bit and see how that yeah. see how that goes. So I changed my um, ideal client to someone different. The avatar was someone different. So I was starting to speak to other creatives. So adjacent fields. So this could be other videographers, filmmakers. This could also be other designers or something that will help them get better at, say, creating content for themselves. And then I would sprinkle in little business stuff here and there. So that was kind of my two avatars that I, I, I started speaking to in my next phase of content. And um, 
I think that's really important because a lot of people think, or there's a lot of advice on the internet, which is like, talk to your ideal client. And if you're, uh, if you're a service provider, if you're a creative entrepreneur, you immediately think your ideal client is your local business, your founder, your marketing director. But the thing is, if you speak to that person, you're really boxing in your message to that one person. And the funny thing is that all these big founders and marketing directors are probably not spending a lot of their time on Instagram. If they're spending yeah. their time on social media, it's most likely LinkedIn or other platforms. Um, so that took me a little while to realize, but once I shifted that and started talking about things like content strategy, general things that everyone can, can get value from, not just the yeah. business owners. And I started talking about storytelling because I developed a passion for storytelling. And I started talking about those things that everyone can resonate with and vibe with and, and actually use practically in their business. Um, that's where I think the shift kind of changed and, and my stuff kind of took off. So, um, yeah, it was, I guess, semi-intentional. I was kind of still figuring things out as I went, but that was kind of the big shift in what I started talking about. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, there's a couple things I want to talk about there. Uh, the first one is that you, you changed what success looked like for you. Like, um, so it went from like, okay me putting in content needs to be equal, me get leads, right? Mm -hmm. And then you change that from, okay, if I show up, that is that is the end result. If I just show up consistently, that is a success. And whatever comes from that, I, I don't know what it is, but I do know consistency will lead to good things. So the, the, the goal changed. Um, I think that's really, really important. You always hear people talk about consistency and like, what's the one piece of advice you can give? It's like, show up repeatedly and see what happens, right? Um, the second thing that you started talking about there was um, you thought that like in the beginning you had to speak business and you had to like just speak directly to the person that was going to potentially hire you. The thing is, if that is such a niche, unique market or a niche, uh, unique, like potential audience, well, then anyone else who sees that is not going to enjoy it. They're not going to like it. They're not going to comment. They're not going to share it. And then the algorithm is going to look at that and be like, this content blows, like we're not going to share it to anyone. So it's almost like in order to reach the right people, you do need to um, kind of cater to the audience that would enjoy it more like a, a wider audience so that it can get liked and it can get shared. And in that process, if it reaches 100,000 people, a million people, then there's actually a much greater chance that your target audience could potentially see it because now it could be recommended to them, right? So there's a concept, I, I think we talked about this before, but it's it's called mixing the food with the medicine, where it's like, okay, the medicine is business, it's business terms. It's like, okay, we're gonna talk about strategy and this and this, but the the food is all the stuff around that, which is like creating content and um, you know storytelling and all this kind of lighter stuff. But at the end of the day, they're connected, right? So if you start talking about storytelling and all of this other stuff, okay, that's cool. That's that's viable to a, a nice big audience. But you hide the medicine in there where it's like, and this can be used for business. And this is how it could, you know. So you're you're kind of getting to the, the same end goal. You're talking about the same thing, but you are um, mixing it with a more palatable uh, like substance so that it can reach a wider audience. So uh, I'll give you kind of an example of this that I've noticed in my own life. If I talk to like my closest friends about business, they they zone out right away. They're like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't yeah. care about that. I don't care. Um, but if I talk about, um, if I talk about how much money I made that month, <laughs> then they're like, oh, uh, like, tell me, <laughs> tell me about that. It's like, ah, yeah, well, here it is. And that came through business. It's like, ah, okay. Like they tune out a little bit again. So you you have to find a way to um, give people what they want to hear, what they're interested in, and use that as a way to kind of link them back to the things that that matter, to the things that like you you care about. And it sounds like that's what you did. Um, the yeah. Could, maybe oh I, yeah yeah if go I for could it. just add on to that because I think this will really reason why I wanted to pause on this because I think it will actually unlock a lot of good things for a lot of people if they just make this belief shift and make this shift in how they 
um, how they approach their content. Um, so my friend, you, you know, Jason, right? Jason Lucas. Um, yes. Yeah. He's also in the, in the Facebook group. He calls it the Trojan horse method, which is essentially market what they want and sell what they need. So yeah. how that looks like in practice is if you are a creative entrepreneur and you're selling some sort of service, service-based business on the back end, say you're a designer, um, you would, instead of putting out content about what you want to sell people, like your design packages and what design can do for business, you would market what design means as a whole. You would market how how people in general can benefit from design. So you'd speak much more broad because you're speaking to what people actually want, which is maybe they do just want a nice logo, but you know that on the back end, that's not what they need. So it's kind of like, this is probably a poor example and designers will, will definitely come at me for this, but it's the first one that popped in my mind because I've heard it so many times, but like, talk about logos, talking about having a really killer logo and what goes into a really killer logo and all those little motifs and little special things that, oh, look closer, look closer, those sort of things. Those, those are kind of sexy yeah, and yeah. that'll reach more people and you'll cast a wider net doing that. And then because you're casting a wider net, it means you're potentially bringing more prospects in right? Your, yeah. your, your, your sample size is larger. And when they come in, that's when you tell them, look, a logo is great, but in reality, here's what you need. Here's, you need yeah. a brand identity. You need a, uh, you need a brand story. You need brand messaging, um, positioning, better positioning, all those things on the back end. So I love that concept because it just, if you, I think if people just took that strategy alone for their content, market what they want, and then sell what they need, um, they would get a lot more results that they're looking for, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Um, I Actually, an example comes to mind that I, I, I'm seeing on Instagram a lot right now. Um, artists, like digital artists that create um, sketches and, and uh, do commission work and stuff like that. Um, there was one artist that I follow uh, I don't remember their their handle. I'll have to look it up and put it in the notes. But um, they started by, yeah, making like awkward videos of them being like, I do commission art and um, hire me and th this is the package and, and everything like that. And then they transitioned to just setting up their, their iPhone and then recording them sketching and like kind of talking through why they sketch and what tools they use and like all of this other stuff that... Has not, they were not asking people to buy at all. They were just showing the process and showing what goes into it and kind of educating. And it was done in a way where it was, it, it was unique. You know, like people were very interested in it and they're like, this looks cool. This looks awesome. And through that, that got a lot more engagement. So it got shown to a lot more people. And uh, as such, people would be like, oh, actually, I really like that art. Like I, I want to contract that person. So by moving away from selling, and just focusing on delivering value, they were able to sell significantly more. Mm -hmm. um, and that they were like, oh, I, I understand now. I get it now. Nobody wants to be sold to. You don't want to go on Instagram and hear someone pitching to you of like, this is why you need to hire me. Yeah. Like lead with value and give people what, you know, they're going to Instagram for. And then you can, yeah, like the Trojan horse, I think is a, is a really good uh, analogy for this. Yeah. Um, I really like that. Yeah. It's a good one. And I think you if you look at any of the successful people online right now, like you look at people like Justin Welsh, for example, I, who I know we both admire quite a bit, or Dan Coe or um, Dakota Robertson, these guys that are absolutely making a killing or just killing it on social media. They're not talking about, hey, this is my... my so f I know Dakota is a, a, a ghostwriter, right? For, for I think... Twitter and stuff like that. Um, he's not talking about online. Hey, you should check out my ghost writing packages here. Here's what I do in my business. And here's all the testimonials we have. I mean, it's a part of it, but he's speaking to high level stuff that everyone can relate to. Like, yeah. um, what's it like to, how can you be more productive as a human being and things like that? So he's writing about things that people want, yeah. the general public want. 
And as a byproduct of that, he's getting interest on the back end for his ghostwriting services because he's already developed the authority by reaching a wider audience. So, yeah, it's uh, quite powerful, I think, for at least for me, it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So now I want to move into a little bit more tactical stuff. So at some point, you're throwing stuff at the wall. You're seeing what sticks, right? And then you start to move the strategy a little bit and you're like, okay, wait, I think if I reach, you know, kind of target a bigger audience and speak more broadly and just give value in that way, I think that's a better way to go. So you kind of figured that out. You course corrected and eventually you hit on a video that just went bonkers, just went nuts. And I've seen this happen before with other people where they, 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 that happens and then they kind of freak out and then they either try to replicate it or they just don't learn from it and they go back to what they were doing before. And um, that isn't what happened with you. I think from an outsider's perspective, that went kind of viral. It raised your other videos and the views and everything and you, you got the uh, uh, influx of subscribers from that. But I think my... my um, my gut tells me that you looked at what worked with that video. You said, okay, I think I understand why this worked. I'm going to use that as a learning experience and adapt my content going forward around this, but I'm not just going to talk about the same thing. I'm not going to just like try to replicate it and ride that wave again and again and again. I'm going to understand why it worked and then infuse that into my other pieces of content going forward. Is it, would that be accurate? Like, is that kind of what, how you thought about that? Yeah, for sure. Like rather than looking at the container that the, that piece of content was in, looking at the why it actually performed well, the why behind it, right? So yeah, yeah 100%. Um, yeah, if you want to, we could talk about that. That's definitely uh interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the, the key thing for me here um, that I'm interested in with this is that it's the course correction because in the beginning, Nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody has any idea. You just show up consistently and then eventually you figure it out. I don't think everyone eventually figures it out though. I think um, you have to look for the signals that come to you of like, oh, this is working. This is not working. Not working, do less of that. Working, do more of this. Mm -hmm. And the really successful people that I've met are just really good at that. They're really good at listening for the signals coming in and then course correcting and adapting. And um, that's something through our conversations that I just like, I, I know works really well for you. You did video outreach a couple times, saw success. You're like, yeah, I'm going to keep doing that. Um, so tell me about that kind of shift where it's like, okay, I learned something from this experience and then I'm going to take what I learned and then adapt that going forward. Uh, yeah. Tell me, tell me about that. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, so I guess for that specific video, what I did, I guess I could just explain from what I did, like what kind of lesson I learned from, from that video and using that to dictate what I, or how I approach my, my future content was rather than like a lot of people, if they, if they have a really successful piece of content, they will look back at it. And that's what I mean by they're looking at just the container that, that it's in. So whether it's the, the structure that it's in, how it's edited, all the surface level stuff, they'll kind of use that and try to replicate it and think that that's the reason that it went viral, but they won't look at the real reason why it went viral, which was probably the messaging, yeah. probably the cadence of how you delivered the message, probably the hook that you used. So all the under the surface level stuff um, that you might miss. So what I did was I kind of, not just for this video, but dissected all the videos that went up with that video was I tried to, I tried to extract all the important whys of each of the content. So why might be, this one had a really good hook. This one created a lot of sense of FOMO in someone. So I'm going to remember that. So I put that to the side and then I'll look at another piece of content and be like, Oh wait, I use an analogy here. That's really cool. So um, I've used analogies a couple of times and that's worked really well and people resonate with that. So I'm taking analogies I'm putting over here. And then another one may be, oh, the way that it could be, look, it could be, oh, the way that this was edited 
and I was able to hack attention this way or make it loop or something like that, those, those small extra things, I might add it as well. Um, and then once you see a bird's eye view of all those little values and unique things that you did, you can kind of start to put together a content strategy that's your own. And that's kind of what I started to do was I looked at all those things and I tried to connect the dots and throw away the stuff that wasn't as important and keep the stuff yeah. that I think will actually be really easy to replicate and use in my future content. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are a couple of examples I can give if you want to go into some of those, some of those examples that I, those lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you already alluded to some of them, you know, like the like the hook in this or the analogy here. Um, and I, I think what you said about the container is the is really important because like, for example, let's say someone um, is doing a bunch of videos and they're using their iPhone. And then all of a sudden they use like a Canon R5 and that video does well. They might think like, oh, Canon videos do well. Uh, that might be a, like a piece of it, but it's way more about the content and about what you said in it. And you, you have to really be able to dissect what worked and what didn't work. And um, yeah, I think that's like, that's a really, really important skill. I think that's a difficult skill to, to, to master, especially yeah. if someone's making content and nothing's kind of hitting, then it's like, well, how do I dissect something that's not getting any views? But uh, yeah, if you have a, a couple more examples, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to hear. Yeah. So I, I I'd just be like, I could just go into some of the concepts and the big takeaways that I'll actually be, I'll probably be creating content about this as well um, in the coming month. But um, one of the big things for me, you know, for content aside from just consistency and showing up and I call it sustainable consistency. So something that you can manage and actually show up consistently and not fall off, right? Some people can do that twice a day other people like me can do that two to three times a week and that works for me, but that allows me to show up sustainably. So aside from consistency, um, there was this big idea that, that I took away from all that content was making content so good, people can't believe it's free. Mm. And that's kind of a nuanced thing. Like it's not really, someone might read that or hear that the first time and think I have to give away all my secrets for free, but that's not what it's saying. I'm saying make content so good, people can't believe it's free. So what that could mean is, for example, there's a lot of advice given online, right? This is another piece of advice given online or a tip that you see online. And you might hear the same thing over and over and over again, and you never really understand it, right? This lesson that everyone talks about. If you're able to take that lesson, that cliche lesson that everyone teaches online and teach it in a way and deliver in a way that finally gives an aha moment for someone, a eureka moment for someone and lights that light bulb in their head and makes them think, ah, now, now I finally get it. Now I finally get it. That's what I mean by making content so good people can't believe it's free. Because mm. now you're, rather than just giving a, any old tip, you're actually inspiring someone to execute and implement that tip and, and use it to their advantage. So um, that's one of them, like the Eureka effect, I call it, is you need to have that aha moment in your content for people to want to share it, for, to, for them to want to comment and engage. And uh, yeah, that was one of the big ones that I kind of took away from, from that period of of all my videos kind of going up so okay um, the you're i i love that uh do you have another one that's um so i think what i think what i'm hearing here correct me if i'm wrong but like you would learn these little micro lessons of like okay that is something that i can use which is good mm -hmm. so then you can then pull that out of your toolbox the next time you create content it's like okay I want to make a eureka moment so that is something that i can pull up but i know there's more of those right where you're like okay another time i learned this and now i'm going to take note of that i'm going to what you're doing is you're kind of developing your framework or your mm -hmm. toolbox that you can then refer to so that in the future when you create content you're not starting from scratch you're starting from like you're pulling tools out of the toolbox and be like i'm going to use this this and this with this subject and then i think it'll do well um 
is that is that kind of like what we're what, what we're breaking down right now yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. those yeah. micro lessons yeah for sure um so i guess another one which i'll take straight from that video that went viral so um, if anyone wants to check it out, the video that went viral is called Video Hooks That No One Is Talking About. And it was a three-part series. So that was part one. That was the first video. And I talked about pattern interrupts, which is just introducing something in your video at the beginning in those first one or three seconds that, um, that stops someone in their tracks, that stops someone from scrolling. This could be a visual effect, like a transition. It could be a big text animation. It could be something weird, or it could be just some sort of movement you know, that'll, that'll kind of stop them doing this because they see something different is happening. Um, so that was the, that was the actual video. And I guess a big micro lesson, which a lot of people will love is this idea of using fear of missing out in the hook. So my hook for that video was video hooks that no one is talking about. And I don't know where I learned this, or, you know, I, I probably stole it from someone somewhere. I probably remixed it from a bunch of different creators. But when I said that to myself, I was like, damn, if I, if I saw a piece of content like that, I would, I would not resist to, to click on it, right? So yeah. it's this idea of introducing FOMO, fear of missing out in your hooks. So that's a big one is like, think of the power words that you can use to introduce that in your hook rather than just saying, here's three tips to create good hooks, right? It's going right, from right. here's three yeah. tips for good hooks to here's a video hook that no one is, that no one's talking about, or yeah. I've never, you've probably never heard before. Um, so those are kind of examples of, of introducing FOMO. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to break this apart a little bit because this kind of goes into another topic that I don't think a lot of people really shine the light on. So these things that you're talking about, the Eureka moments, you know, the video hooks, uh, the FOMO, everything like that. These are a kind of like, almost like rappers for the same message, right? So like, you're like, I have a message. I want to get it out there. Um, I say it just like, kind of like point blank and then it, it goes nowhere. So then you're just like, okay. I'm going to wrap it differently. It's the same message, but I'm going to use different tools or different strategies to get that message out there so that people will listen to it. Mm. And I think sometimes people hear these and they're like, uh, I don't like that that person's hacking my attention. And they, they, they look at it as like, uh, like that's like, it's almost like YouTubers with a, with a mouth open pointing. Right. So I think there's a certain level where it's like, Ugh, like, don't, don't do that. But mm there is a certain level where you you can't deny that like some of this stuff really works and it works because it plays on the human psyche and you can use these things for bad or you can use it for good so yeah. you can use it to um you know like the media does this all the time and they they like oh you won't believe this story that's gonna <laughs> that it's gonna shake the world um so there's ways that you can do it where there's maybe not like a positive outcome and there's ways that you can do it where uh, the outcome is that you get to educate someone on something that could be useful for them and you could use it for positive. You can use it for good. Um, how do you like, how do you feel about this stuff? Like when you figure out something that works and you're like, Oh damn, that was effective. Um, do you wrestle with like, um, yeah. Did, how do you think about this stuff? Do you think about this stuff? Is this something that yeah. you, yeah. yeah. There's a kind of ethical dilemma, right? Like with, with using some of these things and I definitely feel it. I think for me, for me to break through that, there's kind of two things. The first one is understanding that attention is the currency of today and just accepting it. Like that is what it is. I think Alex Hormozzi talks about this all, all the time. Like back in, you know, back in the old days, oil was the, the currency, right? And now today, attention is the new oil. So we have to treat it that way. So I think for a lot of people, like getting over that, getting over that uncomfortability of being someone who understands how to capture and maneuver attention is going to be really important. If you can detach from the kind of, I know it can sometimes feel gross it can sometimes feel uncomfortable but detaching from that has allowed me to share the message that I want to share it's kind of the same thing market what you market what they want sell what they need on a micro level it's almost like hook what they want 
and then explain what they need in the piece of content. So that's the first part is just understand that attention is your friend and the better you are at capturing and leveraging it, the better off you're going to be no matter what you do, whether it's content, whether it's sales conversations, whether it's um, anything, anything. So that was the first thing that I had to kind of switch, switch in my brain. Um, and I guess the second thing is you better back it up. <laughs> like if you're going to do something so ballsy as to say, here's a couple of things that no one is talking about, or here's a couple of things that you've never heard before, the value that you follow up with, the lesson that you follow up with has to has to over deliver. So yeah. that's another thing is like, if you're going to bring attention to something, you better have a, a badass lesson, a killer lesson to go with it. Like yeah. you can't make these claims and, and not back it up. So you, you just, you just have to be good. Like you have to know your stuff. You have to do a lot of research. You have to have practiced the stuff that you're preaching as well. I think that, that kind of, defaults to a place of authority as if it comes from actual experience and practice. And I guess, yeah, just the more that you do that, the more chance that you have of, okay, I'm going to hack the attention, but at least I'm going to have a damn good lesson to, to follow it up. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think that's, I think that's really important. You can't just, uh, go around screaming, screaming all these logic reversal things and then not have any, any good stuff to back it up. So, um, yeah, I mean, like if you look at all the best guys on YouTube, right? If you look at Mr. Beast and you look at MKBHD, MK, I don't know how many letters he has, but all those guys, <laughs> they, they sometimes have these very, um, these very over the top thumbnails and headlines and stuff like that. But you stick around and as an audience, you don't feel tricked are scammed because the value that they follow up with in the actual content is over delivering on your expectations most of the time. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I, I, that's what I, I think that's such a important part because, um, okay. So going back to the example of like, like attention hacking or whatever people say. So the, there's an argument where it's like, well, I don't want my attention hacked. Like I want my attention to be where I want it. And like, I don't like the way social media is going and all this other stuff. But as a, as a, as a species, this is where we're going. Attention is the currency. So you can either fight it and like fail or you can embrace it and then use it for good. So Mr. Beast is a great example. He does over the top thumbnails. He does all this other stuff. He gives away so much money. He, he takes virtually nothing for himself. And he makes, you know, he makes this crazy amount of money and he turns around and invests it right back into his team, into the content, into, um, you know, just giving money away to people and changing people's lives. Um, he's getting into chocolate, I think now. And he's like, well, the chocolate that's out there is bad for people. It's got bad ingredients. It tastes bad. And he's like, why don't we just do it better and like provide a better experience, a better product for people. So you can... You can hack the attention for a, a, a bad reason, or you can like, if, if you're fighting for people's attention, I look at it where it's like, their attention is gonna go somewhere, no matter what. Yeah. Wouldn't you rather their attention go somewhere that could be positive for them, where that maybe they could learn a skill or like uh, to a positive cause? Like, if you look at it from that direction, then it's like, okay, if, if the content or, or sorry, if the um, attention is going to go somewhere, then maybe I can help influence it to go in a more positive direction that can, that can help them. And then in the process, help me. Um, that's kind of the way that I, I, I look at it. And I think the best creators that are out there um, look at it through that scenario as well. People look at YouTubers that are like, oh, well, they make tons of money, like, oh, like, uh, good for them. But what, what value are they providing? Well, for me, I didn't know how to do video at all. I didn't know how to run a video business. I learned everything from YouTube. I learned so much about business from YouTube. These YouTubers are putting value out there for free, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the more value that you can put out there for free and educate people and influence them in a positive way, uh, yeah, like the more you will benefit from that as well. I think it's a win-win scenario. Um, but 
if you're not from marketing, if you're not from advertising, all of this stuff can seem kind of overwhelming and seem like almost like you're getting the the wool pulled over your eyes. And I think since the dawn of marketing, since the dawn of advertising, there's been people that have used it for good and people that have used it for maybe not as good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's important to just realize that, know which side you're batting on and yeah. embrace it. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the easiest thing to do that is like, for me, I've I've struggled with this and I've juggled with this, but if you just look at yourself in the mirror and, and ask yourself, like, do you have good intentions? At the end of the day, are you a good person and are you trying to provide positive, valuable things and inject valuable energy into the world and you can say yes to that? Then don't be afraid to reach more people and reaching if reaching more people means you have to learn how to capture attention, then that's all right because at least you have good intentions behind the content that you're making. So yeah, 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 hundred percent. I mean, like okay. I'll, I'll say for example, like dude, one of the things that that kind of comes to mind for you is when you posted that video outreach method. I remember the first one to five seconds. You were like, "Sorry, guys." The, the headline is a little is a little gross and I don't I don't usually use this but then you went on to absolutely destroy all expectations in terms of this method that you're giving out for free in this Facebook free Facebook group that would potentially bring in thousands and thousands of dollars for everyone that watched it like that's a perfect example of look, you don't have to feel bad about that headline. <laughs> like, Justin, like, I remember, what was it? Like, how to get unlimited, unlimited clients? Uh, it, it was, it was, it was, um, <clears throat> this is how I get unlimited clients for my video business. And what's funny is like, I remember I, I recorded the video and it was like done. And then I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta make some kind of intro. And I was going to go with, this is how I do video outreach. But then I know nobody really wants to, nobody wakes up and they're like, I can't wait to do video outreach. So it's like, well, nobody's going to care about that. Nobody wants that. What do the people in this group want? They want leads for their video business. And this is literally how in the beginning I got like all of the, all the customers that worked with me, all of our clients was through video outreach basically. So, okay this is how I get unlimited <laughs> clients for my video business, yeah. which is technically true, but it felt cringy. And I was like, sorry, <laughs> like, uh, but from me doing it that way and from me uh, using that headline, I know more people clicked on it. They watched it almost to be like, nah, I'm not going to like this. And then they watched it and they're like, okay, this is actually valuable. Yeah. yeah. So it, there was like an, an intention there, but the inner part of me was juggling with like, do I, do I use it for this? Is this? Yeah. 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 It's a kind of a weird thing. But the thing is like, you could have gone extreme on that hook. Like you could have gone extreme on all levels with the the thumbnail and the headline and using extreme FOMO or um, even using just like the, sometimes I use like logic reversal stuff, which is just going against intuition with with, uh, your headline and using all these things to hack attention. But the actual content would have still over delivered on the value that you're promising, which is I think the key point of, of that is, even though you felt uncomfortable with using this psychological hack to, to, to grab attention, the fact that you over delivered on the value and you gave people something so valuable away for free that would help so many people in their businesses generate leads and put, put food on the table, I think is, I mean, one, a testament to, to the type of person you are and the type of person you see when you look in the mirror um, and a testament to the amount of value and knowledge that you just have as a person so yeah i think that was a perfect example yeah what's really interesting about that is like when i posted that video i did i literally expected nothing to come from that like i expected maybe one or two people to watch it and be like cool (laughs) um but like when i figured that out for my business it was it was like a it was a game changer for me so i was like okay i'll share this um I know that like over a hundred thousand dollars has been generated from people using that, like trying that. And um, for those who who don't have context into what this video is, it's literally just me being like, this is how I set up my camera, record a loom video, reach out to brands that have never heard of me and introduce myself. Like this is is my system for how I do that. 
Um, and that was such a, at that point in, in time in my business, that strategy was such like a, there was nothing special about that for me. It was just like something I did. It's like, this is just something I do once a week. <laughs> but then people watching were like, damn, I wouldn't have thought of that. Like that, that's really valuable for me. And this is a part of the reason that I want to talk to people about their systems, about their frameworks, because the way that you think about content creation is maybe just like a thing that's natural to you now, using these little things, using these, these hooks and these different ways to like verbalize your content, but it's not obvious to other people. And I think the best frameworks are the ones that are like so ingrained in us that we don't think it's special, that we don't think people really care about it. But those are the things that are like impressive because it's like it's so internalized that it's basically like science to you now. It's like fact. Yeah. And uh, that's the stuff that's like super interesting to me. Um, yeah. So, OK, I want to talk about your frameworks specifically. I want to get to that. I yeah. realize we've been talking for an hour. You and I could talk about strategy yeah. stuff for like ever. Um, I want to talk about some of the frameworks that you have developed that I've I've seen and I've uh, we've chatted about this. Um, the first one is around your notion kind of content database that you've built. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of spilling the beans here a little bit. But um, <laughs> When you and I talked before, uh, you described to me uh, a database that you built in Notion, which has different categories for like, okay, this piece of content is going to talk about this. I'm going to use this and this is where it's going to go, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And you explained it so matter of factly where it's like, oh, yeah, I just like pull it into this, this. And I was like, what? what headers do you have on that? Like, what, 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 uh, how is that format? I was really curious. And you were telling me, I'm like, I think I've developed mine to be almost like, almost like exactly the same, like very similar. Yeah. Um, and you develop that not to share it with people. You develop that because that is how your brain works and mm -hmm. seeing it laid out this way and organizing it makes it easier for you. So um, talk to me a little bit about that, um, that notion database, how, like why you built it, how you built it and um, how it helped you create better content over time. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, we're very similar. I feel like in the way that we think about process, like I think for both of us, we can both say that process is power, right? Like we can't do the things that we do if we didn't have systemized processes and, and, and these sort of database and internal things to manage our business. So yeah, by default, it was just one of those things that I built out of pure necessity because when you're making content, it can be an absolute mess. It can be a, it can be a slaughterhouse, you know, like, or you can develop processes and, and databases and, 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 and things to help you manage the, the madness, I guess. So, for me, the madness was in, when I first started creating content, the madness was in generating ideas. I think that's a tough spot for a lot of people. Yes. And creating a system to where you take those idea dumps and you spit out these gems of, of, of end content pieces, essentially. So. What I did was I needed a place to upload all my ideas off my brain. And that just so happened to be at the time Notion, which is the software I use. I think it's the software you use. It's the software a lot of people use. And um, I just needed to put it somewhere, right? So I created this idea dump, but then I looked at that idea dump and I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. This is even worse than in my brain. Actually, no. It's on paper, so it's better off when, than, than in my brain. Um, but it just looked like an absolute mess. So I needed to systemize my process into, okay, which of these ideas do I actually like and do I think I can riff on and develop further? So then I created a tab for that. I was like, all right, these are going to be the, the, the pieces that I actually follow through on. So uh, I created a plan tab. And I started moving things over to the plan tab. And then I basically used the plan tab to script those ideas out and develop them further into actual content pieces. 
And then I developed, what's the next stage? This is I got to film the content. So I created a film tab and it just went on and on and on. And I created this, this, this uh, pipeline, essentially, this content pipeline, which started from idea dump to ready to be posted and proud of that piece of content. Um, so it was just, yeah, out of pure necessity that I needed to create that. And it just so happens that it, it looks pretty and, and it's in notion. So, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's so the, process. the the thing I, I love about this is like, th this is a prime example of something that you you've built. That's just kind of like, oh yeah, I just like uh, move these tabs around and put this here. And it's so like, it's so like nonchalant the way you're like, ah, oh, I just, the, uh, uh. but that is kind of like that, that that's a peek into the inner workings of, of how you work and how you function. So in order to build like a, a computer. There's so many little systems that need to go into that computer, little uh, microchips and little processes that need to work together. Um, you can't just have a computer without these little individual pieces. And once these little individual pieces are built, you don't have to think about that piece again. It just works. And then it gets integrated into your life and into your process. So um, over time, you develop this, uh, this, this template and even now, I think you're underselling a little bit. Like, I know that when you have an idea, you put it into this. And then the next thing you probably do is you score that idea on how valuable is this? Like, do, do like, is this something that's relevant? Is this something that I, you know, have uh, the knowledge to speak about? Is this something that lights me up? Is this something that would do well? So you, you then like take the idea, you score it. And in that instant, you can basically be like, yes or no to that. And if it's a yes, it's like, okay, then I'll go to the next step. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you take it a step further. And I, I know you integrate some of these uh, other frameworks that you talked about, like the video hooks and the FOMO, where it's like, okay, I'm going to approach it from this lens. I'm going to take this angle on it. Um, and at the end of the, the process, you're able to take this fuzzy thing. I think so many people have these ideas, but they don't know how to turn this into a final product. Mm -hmm. So over time, you've learned how to like take these fuzzy ideas, integrate them in, and turn them into a, a final product. And now the content creation piece is just a system that you follow. And there's, it's still maybe a little bit difficult. It's still, there's still like, you know, you got to set the cameras up and everything else, but you don't have to think from the very beginning, every single time, oh, I got to, I got to post a video. What should I post? Okay, maybe this, I don't know. Like, let me, you have a system. You can score the ideas, you can uh, plan it, execute it, and get it out there with very high certainty that it's going to do a certain amount or it's going to do a certain thing. And I think all, all good creators have their own systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you need to in order to be consistent and in order to, to grow and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, just to circle it back, the the way that you're like, oh yeah, I just kind of do this. That's the thing I'm talking about. That's what yeah. I'm talking about. I mean, yeah. yeah, cause like, I guess this is gonna sound really douchey, but I guess when you get to a certain point in in your business and career, there's other things that I guess excite you versus the internal processes that you've just set up because you had to. So. It's like I'm excited about like these 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 things like the like figuring out these little micro lessons in my content and the eureka moment and what's the next piece of viral thing that I can create or idea that I can inject into the world. So when you look at your little database in Notion, you're just like, ah, it's just it's just the thing that's there. Um, but it like you cannot. I think I guess what we're saying here is you cannot ignore that. Like that's just as important yeah. as that next viral video or viral script that you create because everyone's trying to everyone's trying to perfect their content right but yeah i like you can't get perfection without process so yeah. it's like staring at a blank page of paper and trying to come up with a content idea or trying to write a book with a blank page of paper versus having a whiteboard with sticky notes and 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 pens and colorful pens and stuff and I mean, like, that's just for me, like I'm a more visual person. It might be something different for others, but that's how I, how I visualize it. So yeah. Yeah. Same. Process, man. Okay. So, um, 
let's talk a little bit about like if if someone wanted to be Jerry, if someone wanted to kind of have some of the same results. If you could kind of talk to some of the most important skills that have helped you to 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 get to that end result of like over a hundred thousand, um, what would some of those skills or qualities be? Like, what, what what does someone need to learn in order to kind of take that uh, take things to that level? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's so much man i'm just i'm just trying to see if we can if we could distill it a little bit more i mean like i think the one skill and like you said what's the one skill that people can learn i think the one skill that people can learn is how to learn like how to learn the yeah. right things how to research the right things and how to go about your research because no one posturing on the internet entirely knows what they're what they're doing at any one at any one moment. I mean, like for me, for sure, it looks like with the with the number that I know exactly what I'm doing, but half the time I'm just finding ideas that I resonate with and vibe with and remixing it and coming up with my own opinions and flipping the script and playing devil's advocate on some other piece of content that I saw. So really it's just um yeah expanding your your knowledge and expanding expanding the things that you're interested in um and just being curious about everything so i, like I that. think that's the first part is just um learn more cool stuff because yeah. if you don't know how to i mean part of it is implementation and the execution for sure um but learning about cool stuff will make you passionate about the cool stuff and it'll be much easier to teach cool stuff. Um, so for me, that was storytelling. Like I am, if you asked me what level of storyteller I am, I'd still consider myself an infant because I know so many other people that are just levels above that know so many more frameworks that know so many more little techniques and know so many more, um, you know, watch so many more video essays and, and broken down cinema and stuff like that. And I'm just this dude trying to practice it every day and trying to learn new techniques and trying to use it in my own content. And I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm particularly good at it, but at least I've started learning about it and I continue to want to progress in it. And I think that's the most important thing and it is relevant today, which is a bonus. Um, so that's what I mean by just learn cool stuff, right? Like, yeah. Learn cool stuff and you'll be able to teach cool stuff and people yeah. like cool stuff. <laughs> All right. I like that. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the fundamental skill of how to Google and learn and continue doing that just to infinity, I think, I think that should be definitely taught in schools. Like just be curious and just keep going. And, um, I think a lot of the, the best creators that are out there didn't get into it because they're like, I want to make a million dollars. They get into it because they're like, I'm very interested in this thing. So I'm just going to do it. Like yeah. you have to have that kind of core level interest in something to push through these inhumane levels of uh, challenge and frustration that come from building anything. So, yeah. um, and then the second one you said was storytelling. And I love that. You and I have talked about storytelling a lot. Um, I'll save this next question for the end about like some resources or examples that people could uh, lean into uh, or books that they can read. But um, okay, I will push back a, a tiny bit on uh, the skills. You also need to know how to film yourself <laughs> yeah. uh, in order to, <laughs> uh, I mean, you could maybe, yeah, no, you, you need to know how to do that. You need to know how to edit in a, in certain ways. Um, I've seen a lot of people grow very big without using uh, good cameras like the ones that we're maybe using right now, just using their iPhone. Um, and then editing, editing has come such a long way. There's so many like apps on the phone that you can use to add captions now and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. if, if you could um, maybe talk to you from four years ago and be like, Hey man, <laughs> I only got five minutes to talk to you. You're going to, you're going to grow to like a hundred thousand on Instagram. And like, these are the, the skills you need to lean into to do that. Um, 
would you say like editing is more important than the filming or like where would you rank like filming editing storytelling um content uh, ideas like what what would that breakdown look like for you yeah so i would put messaging at the top messaging okay. like i guess aside from learning and obviously applying like we could learn a lot but you got to apply and practice it is um messaging so like being able to simplify complex concepts into you know little valuable micro lessons that people can take away and and implement themselves so that's just specifically for content i think messaging as a whole is is extremely important and i know it's kind of a buzzword and a fuzzy word as well but when you get into the into the thick of understanding messaging and and brand messaging it can get really really fun so yeah aside from that i would say like yeah editing is is pretty is pretty damn important cuz yeah. editing kind of goes hand in hand with messaging cuz editing helps you most people think editing is just slapping on transitions and and color grades and and captions but it's it's a lot more than that if you want to be a good editor and i've seen some of the best editors in the world like if you if you just google youtube and you you look at people like Hayden Hillier Smith i don't know if you follow him but he was Logan Paul's editor yeah. um i didn't, i think he did some Mr Beast videos too but he's not just an editor. He calls himself an editor, but really what he is is a masterful storyteller. And if you can edit videos with understanding of story structure, understanding of um, cadence of delivery, like when to yeah. add like a half beat somewhere when someone's in mid dialogue, when to pause music to create more impact, like. These are the things that I think especially in the age of content are going to differentiate people if you're creating video content. So totally. First get your message right, have something valuable to say, but then how you edit it has to match up with that to the way in the way that it's going to impact people. Like just slapping on slapping on emojis and Alex Hormozy captions and and transitions is not going to it's not going to do you much if you don't know how to edit with story and and cadence and and pacing um so yeah, yeah editing after that and then i would say filming like yeah it's yeah i think it's important especially cuz everyone has a 4k camera in their pocket now so the ability to um show up on social media looking a little bit more professional looking a little bit more put together than most people is going to be I would say overall an advantage some people might debate me on that um yeah. but yeah then filming after I'd say yeah so. I think that's I think that the the way that you structured that like in the importance I think is spot on I completely agree with that you could be you could shoot the best looking videos in the world but if there's no message behind it that no one's going to watch for more than five seconds they're like what am i looking at 4k video background i, I don't <laughs> have time for this shit um yeah and the editing i think is super important like i've seen creators um who start by filming themselves and editing themselves and then they outsource the editing to someone else it's the exact same content is the exact same video but the package that it comes in hits very differently so um yeah, I, I think those are I think those are definitely the skills uh, to to focus on. Um, OK, I'm going to move on. So the next one is tools and equipment. Hmm. I want you to give me just like a, a speed round of like the tools that you use for Instagram specifically. So hmm. whether this is like video editing or the camera that you use, um, I want to talk specifically about what you use. And then I want to bring that back and be like, OK, if you could only use some of this stuff, like if you had to sacrifice some of this stuff, what, what would that look like? And what would like your 80, 20 tools be? So, um, first speed round, what do you use to shoot, edit lights, all that stuff? Just top of your head. Oh, like, like, um, like hardware. Uh, so yep. shoot camera body is Sony a seven S three. That's my a cam. I have a Sony A6400 that I'm using as my webcam right now, but it really doesn't serve any other purpose. That was my first camera. I'm not going to sell it, but right now it's being used as a webcam. Um, and then lens, 
ecosystem is Sigma. I've grown up with Sigma. Um, my sister's first DSLR, I saw Sigma on there and she said it was the best lens you could ever get. So ever since then, I don't know if it's true nowadays, but I know they're pretty damn good for, for their price. So I use Sigma. So I have a 24 to 70 F2.8 on my A7S III. And when I shoot APS-C, I have the 18 to 35 F1.8 art lens, which I love. And I'm tempted nice. to go back to APS-C just to use that, just to use that lens. Um, yeah. But those are my two main lenses. And then lights. I use a, oh, Lights is an interesting one. So I just discovered this brand called Colbor. It's not sponsored, <laughs> no affiliation. Be cool if they wanted to sponsor um, because I really vibe with their products and they're doing a lot of cool things. But there's this little COB LED light that uh, fits into the palm of your hand. So I'm using it right now and I use it for my all my client shoots. It's a 100 watt light. It's called the CL100. X, Y, Z, something. Um, and it's, yeah, it's tiny. It's It's got a full metal body and it's no fan noise. It fits in the palm of my hand and uh, it works well. Yeah, it's really good. So that's what I use for my, my key light. What kind and of softbox do you have on there? I have uh, an Ambitful one. Another brand most people might not know about, but um, I have quite... I've tried a couple of their products and they're all really high quality. Um, cool. So Ambitful Softbox, um, a small rig light stand, and then audio. Right now here I'm using the SM57, the Shure SM57, which I believe Great has the microphone. same I yeah. believe has the same capsule as as the SM7B. So that's why it does. I've had this yeah. since I was a kid. So I kind of kept it. And um, my mic for interviews i'll either use the a wireless mic so i actually use a godox wireless system which i've been testing which is has been actually pretty good if not i'll use the rode wireless and a lav mic or i'll use a sennheiser mke 600 which i got nice. recently um does that cover it in terms of hardware oh editing Inside. MacBook. Yeah, yeah. M1, um, M1 Pro. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, now let's go do a speed round on software. So um, what do you use to edit? What do you use to... Um, let's uh, all... Let's not cover too much about the video production stuff, about like what you use to deliver files and stuff like that. Okay. I more want to know your process for the Instagram stuff specifically. Okay. Um, because it's, a, it's similar, but it's a little bit different. Like when I do Instagram stuff... I record on the camera, bring it over to the MacBook, edit, and then airdrop. <laughs> I can't airdrop to a client. So okay. uh, what does what your process look like for software? Cool. So I guess this, it makes the most sense for me just to go from the beginning of the process. So the beginning of the process yeah. is idea generation. So softwares for that are usually Spotify because <laughs> I listen to a lot of podcasts on Spotify. Um, and I will use Audible for audiobooks and... Um, yeah, so that's idea generation. And then I'll just get thoughts throughout the day in the shower on the on the train or something. Um, so that's idea generation. Idea dump is Notion, as I mentioned. And then scripting and everything is Notion. And then I film and then I edit in Premiere Pro. Premiere Pro, dabble with After Effects sometimes, not really, only when needed. And then that piece of content will usually go into Descript which will give you that, um, the transcription and the animated captions. And that's just what I've used for the longest time. Um, so Descript and then, yeah, that's it. And it's really just a couple of tools I'm trying to think if there's anything I'm missing. No. And then just like I, I deliver a notion too, if you want to go into delivery. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. That, uh, that's a, that's a pretty good rundown. Um, if you had all of your stuff stolen and you needed to just like grab the essentials uh, for, for hardware wise, what would be like the one camera, the one lens, the one light that you would grab? I guess the light would be probably what you have, but um, yeah, if you could just use one camera and one lens for the Instagram stuff, what would it be? One camera, one lens would still be what I have now. So Sony a7S three with the Sigma 24 to 70, I need a zoom 
you know, 24 to 70. And then lights, hmm, I would, I would want to try their 200 watt variant. So I have the 100 watt right now. And I find that on some shoots, I need that extra power. So I would probably upgrade to their, I think it's their CL220, um, okay. which is really, uh, I think it's quite new as well. It just came out. So I'd love to test that. Uh, for light and then same softbox i love the softbox and uh anything else did you was it audio or just that yeah i mean like if um if you could pick one mic that you would have to keep just one uh sennheiser sennheiser mk 600 yeah dope mic gotcha okay um there is another question here that I wanted to go over and it's, it's the process, but you kind of did that with the, with the tools of like, okay, I generate ideas using this and then I idea dump using this. Yeah. Is there, um, maybe let's just focus directly on the process of you scripting it out. If, if there's a script, like going from idea to setting up the cameras, shooting to editing to delivery. Uh, do you, do you have any process around that? Yes. So idea dump is just idea dump, right? So I put it into notion and then I'll sit down like once, like back little secret. I'm not really creating content at the moment, but I will be back. I will be back soon. Um, but back when I was in the thick of, in the thick of my, my content, it was once a, once a month or once every two months, depending on my energy level, um, I would idea dump at least 12, 12 ideas. Um, no, sometimes more than that. So probably more like, more like 15 or 16 ideas. And then of those, like, 15, it, like in a day, sorry. Yeah. In a day. Yeah. Interesting. And I actually okay. have a process to do more than that. So, huh. yeah, we can get into that in a bit too as well. But, um, so usually I like to start with, I usually have 12 ideas banked just from walking on the street and like thinking about stuff and listening to podcasts and watching YouTube videos. I usually have 12 saved up already by the, by the time it's time to film content. So now it's just a matter of which one's going to pass. So, um, yeah, I usually have a little more than 12 and I'll, try to come up with, uh, try to take 12 into the scripting process. So I'll kind of look at the content pieces, see what I vibe with, see what I don't. Um, and yeah, I'll bring them into the scripting stage, which I do in Notion as well. And my scripting process is, is really kind of my most creative part. I guess I don't, the, the only part I don't really have a specific process I know I have my own tools and my own, like the micro lessons that I took away. So if I go into say a content piece about um, video content, how to film better videos on your iPhone, for example, um, I would look at that piece and look at the lesson that I wanna give away and think about what kind of hook do I wanna use? What, what's applicable here? Can I use FOMO here? Is there even a need to use FOMO here? Is this something where I use a power word in the in the in the hook, or um, you know, I just think about the hook. I mean, the hook is extremely important because if you don't, like as we said, if you don't grab the attention, you could have a viral video on the back end and no one will ever see it. So I really focus in on the hook, try to get that right, and then the next part is how do I set up the punchline. So that's another thing I've learned from my content. I'll just sprinkle this in there. But um, like like comedians, I think as it, I think we should think of content like comedians think about their jokes. Like comedians don't just comedians will hook you in, right? Well, they'll hook you in with a the story. They'll hook you in with some line, which kind of sets up. Oh, I'm about to tell a joke. But they don't go in and straight. They don't. They don't, they don't go in for the kill like straight away, right? <laughs> they they set up the story. They set it up. They they leave you wondering. They create the mystery. They create the tension. I like to call it. And then they come in with the punchline, and everyone laughs. But they only laugh so hard because of what they did prior to the punchline. So for content, that's what I do for my script. Is like, I think, what's the setup before I get to the punchline? In this case, the punchline is the actual piece of value I want to give. 
Um, and then that's where I throw in Eureka. I throw in analogies. I throw in all these other uh, content psychology techniques that I've learned myself. And then once that's good, I find a day, usually in the same week while it's fresh in mind, um, to film it all. So I'll film it all in one day. I like to batch content. It's just the easiest way for me, especially if I've got client stuff going on. Um, how many how many videos do you film at one time? I'll try to film 12 and try to film 12 a day. Yeah. And if I want to do, so sometimes I'll, I'll feel good and I can film another day. So I'll separate another day and I'll do another 12. So I have 24. So I have two months worth. And that was my cadence in the past. Um, so that comes to like two, two, uh, two a week. Yeah. So, uh, no, sorry. Three a week, three a week. So I'll film, I'll set up my lights in this studio, basically. And uh, yeah, I'll just film them back to back to back. I'll just have my iPad down here with my Notion scripts and I'll just click record. And I guess if you wanna get into, into the real nitty gritty of it, I really like to separate my, my sentences so a lot of people, and I see this with my clients, is they'll see a script and they're like, I'm gonna do this in one go. Like I'm gonna say it like I, I mean it and just just give it to me, I'll, I'll manage the script all on my own. And it, it ends up being something that's kind of like unnatural, awkward, and there's stutters yeah. and they're just trying to do it over and over and again. I'm just like, stop. Look, we have the power of editing and we have the power of jump cuts. Just do it line by line. So that's how I do it for myself. And that helps you kind of um, anticipate uh, cadence and pacing and emphasis and intonation and stuff, which really helps me. So if you can break things up, that's really good. And then editing will either, I'll throw it into Premiere Pro, I'll edit myself, or I'll send it to my editor who I've recently brought on this year. Um, nice. And then, yeah, I'll get the kind of um, base edit. I'll throw it into the script, get the captions, and then that's uh, pretty much ready to go, man. And uh, I don't use any fancy scheduling software because it's a headache and I think it's more mess for me. I'm kind of a, an essentialist with a lot of stuff. So I just uh, schedule manually and post manually. Yeah. yeah. So there's, I, I already know the questions that will come back from this are um, like, I, I tried to dig into it a little bit. Like you, you film 12 in a day and you're like, oh yeah, I just filmed 12. Like, <laughs> that is another nonchalant thing where it's like, damn, that's, that's impressive, dude. But it it kind of goes back to the punchline thing where it's like, well, yeah, like that's the punchline. But the only reason that the punchline is so effective is because of all the stuff that comes before the punchline. Mm -hmm. It's all the preparation, the scripting, the idea, like all of that can take days to weeks, right? And then you batch the, the shooting, um, the filming, and then yeah, the edit. And then, so it sounds like you could do a whole month of content basically in, in one day, like film a whole month's worth of content in one day. So- yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> I uh, started doing like videos and stuff um, on my Instagram I, I, like two months ago. And I went about it a completely different way. And I was like, this is not sustainable at all. I don't know how the fuck people do this. I was like, every day I'm going to go to the coffee shop and script something and then run and film it and then edit it. And then I'm like, yeah, this is not <laughs> this is not the way to do it. Which is funny because like when I was working with the video clients, I would have never attempted to do anything like that. I'd be like, yeah. no, we got to plan in advance and then we got to do jump cuts because you're not going to nail it in one take. Dude, I, I'm not even joking. I would sit there in the park with my camera and be like, I'm going to get this in one take. It's going to be one fluid <laughs> take. And I would sit there for like an hour yeah. and then someone would watch it and be like, wow, you're really good on camera. You just said it. I'm like, oh, you don't know how many yeah, takes no it took me. Like, like my camera battery died. I, yeah. So <laughs> the way, the, the way that you charge it first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, now the camera overheated. Damn it. So, um, there's, there's so many little things there yeah. where to you, it's just intuitive. And even to a fellow video person who spent a couple of years running a video production company, yeah. um, it's not completely intuitive to me, but what you have now and the system that you have now and the way that you're you're able to go about it, you are able to do it consistently in a high quality. And all of that comes down to the system that you use, that you've developed, the framework that you uh, use that you've developed. I think that almost anyone could follow that similar framework 
and come out to maybe not the exact same results, but like they could be consistent with it. They could take their ideas from, um, you know, just fuzzy thoughts into fruition. Um, and it's really, it's a testament to, yeah, like to how your brain works and how you think in terms of systems and processes. Um, I know one of the questions that might come up is, uh, w would you ever think of selling your or making available like your notion kind of framework? I'll preface this by saying like one, one of your hesitations might be like, well, this is the way that my brain works. So I don't know if people would be interested. Yes, they will be interested. Um, would you be, would you ever think about making that public for people and like, yeah. 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 Um, I definitely, I have thought about it. Um, mainly just through conversations like this and talking to people and like, you should just put that in your link in bio. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I probably could. Um, yeah, I'll definitely make it public, uh, free paid. I'm not sure. Um, that's the thing for me is like, this is just, it's just, it's my process. So I feel like I would maybe perhaps undervalue it if people gave me feedback and said that is, is undervalued, then I would think that. But right now I think it's, I think I'd be happy to give it out for free. Um, but yeah, I've, I have been thinking about these things and that's part of the reason why I've kind of paused a little on the content right now is, well, one reason is just I've been booked up with client stuff and I've been focusing on fulfilling that stuff. But the second part is like, okay, I've given a ton of free value out and I've built my audience and I've gotten the reward from it. And I'm grateful for the audience for sure. And I, I don't take them for granted at all. Um, but now is like, how do I add more value and create more impact yeah. and do some more meaningful things? And um, that stuff takes time, man. That stuff takes time, especially with a whole other business on the side. Um, yeah. So... I'm I'm thinking through that. I'm figuring it out as I go, but that's kind of the next step for me is like asking what people want and just trying to deliver some value. And if I can make a living doing that, that's just that's the bonus. So yeah, that's yeah. the next step. So I I want to touch on a couple of things there. That um the first one is that I, I'm probably gonna break some people's hearts here, but I don't recommend that you give it over for free simply for the reason that it took you tons of time and energy to create that process. It, it took months to get it to a point where it's like, okay, th this now works for me. So one, you've already invested a lot of time and energy into that, which is valuable. Uh, the second thing, it is valuable. <laughs> like people would value that. But yeah. three, the most important thing is they will, I believe they will value it more if there is a dollar amount attached to it. So there's, countless case studies out there where someone puts something out and it's free and because it's free people don't value it so they don't take it seriously and they don't use it um whereas if you have to pay for it even if it's just a dollar even if it's something like alex hormozy launched a book sold it for a dollar and he's like it's it's not meant to make money it's just meant to be a little bit of friction to make someone value it right mm -hmm. so um if you price it it is still going to be a no-brainer purchase for anyone that could use it and benefit from it. Yeah. Um, but even to go a step further from this, this is something that I think a lot of creatives struggle with. Um, one of the last calls that I did, we talked about this where it's like, wait, you, you want to pay me to do something that I like, just like doing like, yes. <laughs> um, even though this is just like you kind of selling your, your process or putting your process out there. Um, if you can sell it and it provides value to people to the point where like, even if they spent 20 bucks on it or 50 bucks on it, they're like, damn, that was definitely worth it. Then what a freaking awesome incentive for you to keep going and keep, you know, developing things that you can give away or, you know, sell or, or, or whatever it is. But if we do it for free, you will get burnt out so quickly. And it, it it's not a win-win scenario at that point. It's just a win for the people that you're giving it to, but it's not really a win for you. Mm -hmm. And creating those win-win scenarios, I think is super, super important for any long-term creator to, to, to thrive. So, uh, yeah, if someone uncovered the perfect chocolate bar recipe, like no one would be like, Oh, you shouldn't sell chocolate bars. They'd be like, Oh yeah, make that like, 
Yeah, I, I, yeah. I want to buy that, right? Yeah. So, 100%. Um, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, so I'll just add one thing to that is like, yeah, I 100%, 100% agree. And uh, this has been marinating in my brain for, for quite a while now. Like the the idea of freebies and, and lead magnets and trip wires and all these, you know, direct response sort of things. Um, but yeah, it's so true because just, I mean, even if I look back at some of my own purchases, the free ones are the ones I never used. Yeah. So that's the one thing that bugs me about free is like just based on psychology and the and the um, connotation of free kind of already reduces the value of the thing by default. Whereas Alex Ramosi, he put something out for a dollar, you think rather than, oh, this is free, I can do this whenever I want. If I don't touch it, no big deal. Whereas if you get something for a dollar, you're like, holy shit, I got all of this for a dollar. Cause now there's an actual yeah. dollar amount and a value. So I 100%, yeah, 100% agree with that. So. Yes, definitely. I will. <laughs> I'm keeping that in mind for sure. Keeping that in mind. For All sure. right. Okay. So there's there's three more questions that I want to get through, uh, and we can do them pretty pretty quickly. But before we wrap up the call, if it's okay with you, I want to kind of go off the rails after these questions, and I want to talk to you about like what's coming next for you. Wh where do you want to push things? Um, and how do you feel like your community that you've built up will will be like a conduit to that? So those are the things that excite me the most. Um, but I want to get through the format here because I know Let's this other it. stuff will be valuable as well. So tell me, so in, in your process of throwing things at the wall, seeing what sticks, what did you personally try that maybe didn't work for you? And this isn't like things that didn't work or should people shouldn't do. This is things that maybe you tried that just didn't work for you. Hmm. In the content, in the content process, in the content process. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, big one is following trends. I tried the whole trending audio thing because people were pushing that a lot. Um, I mean like trends kind of encompasses so much because there's so much advice on, especially Instagram with how to grow and you know, it's all the things that revolve around what people assume the way to grow is because people just echo, it's like an echo chamber, right? So the first one is following trends. The second one is engagement tactics. The third one is... Oh, there was one more. I did a post on this, man, but I'll probably have to look back. Um, but but are, before you before you go points. there, what, what is engagement tactics? What is what is so, that? So on Instagram and a lot of places, you'll hear this idea that you need to engage to to bring people to your page. So what that means is it could come in the form of adding a valuable comment to someone else's post who's in your niche, um, which will potentially bring eyeballs to your handle and bring people to your page who might see your stuff and follow you. So, I mean, that is a, is a tactic. Some people see that as just like the social aspect of Instagram, which I totally understand. Um, but for me, I just, it was a low, it was a low leverage activity for me. Engagement is just, I mean, I engage with my community as much as I can on the posts that I post, at least for, at least for an hour after I post, like I don't post in ghosts, which a lot of people talk about. Um, I think that's important, but going out and kind of almost like mining attention, it almost, I, I don't want to say this word, but it almost feels like it. And it felt like this to me at the time, but begging, begging for some sort of attention and engagement, yeah, it just felt gross to me. So I know it does really well for some people and some people have success. And Gary Vee talks about the $1.80 strategy of engagement, which is cool. It's just not my thing. It just, it just yeah. wasn't my thing. So that's that's pretty much engagement engagement tactics. Um, and then the trending the trending audio thing or the trending thing in general was just like seeing what's going viral and seeing how to replicate that. And the problem the big problem with that is, as we said earlier, like you're trying you're associating the success with the container versus the actual message or the actual value in the content. So I stopped doing trending audios super quickly. Yeah. And I focused on the things that we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That was good. That was really good. Um, okay. The next question is risks and pitfalls. So um, I don't know if you've uncovered many risks or pitfalls. Um, I'll, I'll kind of maybe lead with some examples here. Like uh, you could get burnt out from creating content or you, the, the, the pressure of having like a large audience um, or maybe even the exposure of having a large audience and like what that could mean. Is there any kind of risks, risks and pitfalls that come to mind for you, um, either ones that you've experienced yourself or could foresee uh, seeing if your community gets larger? Yeah, I mean, this one, I'm, I'm experiencing this as we speak. <laughs> and we talked about this before the call. But if you intend to get big on social or you intend to grow your audience and you're running another business on the side, don't expect to have much more time <laughs> to like, don't expect to have a ton of time that you did before when you didn't have your audience. Because once you have your audience, you're gonna get a lot of DMs, a lot of interest, um, and you're gonna have to commit to posting content because that's the idea of posting content. So for me right now, the struggle, or at least the reason why I haven't been able to be so consistent on Instagram is because when I hit 100K, I got booked up like that and I was at capacity, My I generated a pretty long wait list and I just had to fill, fulfill on, on client work and client projects. And that meant I didn't really have more time to to give to, to, to content. And I feel really bad that I, I fell off, but you know, for me, the priority is what's putting money on the table and I think it'll always be that way for people and that was to over deliver for my clients so I had to shift my focus focus a little bit more on my clients but in saying that knowing that I was always going to come back and I was going to come back with a bang and come back with value and come back with new lessons from all these client projects as well so that's I think kind of been my saving grace and just knowing that within yourself is is really important as well so um, yeah man it's just I guess another thing with the burnout thing is, yeah, be easy on yourself, right? <laughs> there's yeah. such there's such a, a hustle culture going on, especially on the internet. I think it's dying down a little bit with the help of some voices. Um, yeah. Some people like yours, man, like I, I love that you're putting out there that, you know, less is more. I believe that too, essentialist mindset. Um, so yeah, I just, I'd say be kind to yourself, like, I know it's important to have, to commit to goals and commit to specific things because you want to succeed and you want to get a certain place and you want to reach a certain destination. But if that's coming at the cost of your brain, at the cost of your closest relationships, at the cost of just being a human being, then you got to step back and, and, and take a breather. And sometimes you do have to prioritize things and shift focus and be okay with that. So. Yeah, I love that. I, I think one of the things that, um, so you mentioned consistency before, right? And I think some people hear the word consistency and they think like it means one thing, but it, 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 it doesn't. Consistency is different for everyone. So when I heard consistency, I was like, oh, I just got to post every day. <laughs> Well, that's not sustainable at all. And I learned that pretty quickly. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's a recipe for direct, like train to burnout. Yeah. So um, the way that you described consistency was uh, more like, okay, I'm going to batch the ideas, I'm going to shoot them, and then I post two to three times a week. And that that's good. As long as you just follow that, that that's consistency. That's good. That's showing up, right? Mm -hmm. So find the the schedule or the the process or uh, whatever it is that works for you that that you can do and feel good about um and still make progress towards those goals i think that's really important that's that's a hard lesson that i had to learn um and yeah i, I do think the the hustle culture um is getting swung back in a different direction luckily uh luckily uh, i i yeah i think it, it needs to um okay so the last question that i wanted to ask you and then i, I want to ask you some kind of bonus round questions is around resources so 
Is there any books or YouTube channels or pieces of content that you recommend um, that people could kind of learn more about some of the stuff that you've learned about? You've mentioned Alex Hormozzi, uh, Justin Welsh, Dan Coe, uh, Hayden Smith. And I know before we talked a little bit about, uh, like before this call, we talked about uh, Tom Nosk, I believe. Um, get, get, just kind of quickly run me through each of these people and what, what do you like about them and what do you think people could gain from from watching their content or, or yeah. Yeah, so most recently for me has been Hormozy, and I think probably a lot of people watching this can say the same thing. There's just something about him, the, the way that he the way that he delivers information is just, just unmatched, right? Um, so I think the biggest takeaway for me from Alex Hormozzi is, you know, not that he's building, you know, this huge, like his goal to a billion dollar valuation and stuff like that, um, but more so looking at how he approaches content because he's very smart clearly in business and he takes the same sort of philosophy into his content even though he says all the time that actually content is not his main focus it's only one of the gears in his machine right um but one thing you can learn from him is how he condenses complex topics that aha moment like every yeah. single short every single reel every single tweet every single YouTube video I watch, there's always some sort of aha moment for me. And oftentimes there's like, if it's a long form, 10 minute YouTube video, there's like 10 aha moments for me, which is why people love him so much. And another clue that I'll kind of bring back to this idea of the aha moment and why it's so important is I was listening to his podcast with Chris Williamson, you know, Modern Wisdom, have you? Have you yeah, yeah. heard that? Yeah. So his podcast with Chris Williamson, he was dropping a lot of bombs, right? Intentionally. And there was one thing that was super unintentional that he said in passing that was a real big clue into how he thinks about content. And there was one point where he was talking to Chris and Chris asked him to give advice about something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but Alex's response was, Wait, just give me a second. I'm trying to think of a way to say this to where it finally hits. So that thing in passing was like, it just blew my mind because it was the perfect, I mean, maybe it's just justifying my bias or something, it's confirmation bias, right? But that just perfectly encompassed how he thought about his content, which was like, hold on. I know so many people have said the same thing on the internet but I want someone out there to hear what I'm about to say and make it finally click for them. And I think that's just like, it just speaks worlds for how he thinks about his content and how he thinks about his message. And that's why I'm so insistent on this idea of this aha moment and making things click for people because you can literally repeat the same shit all day, every day, but if you don't make it resonate, you're just, you're not gonna get anywhere, so yeah. Yeah. Hormozy for sure. I really like that. It's so much like it's it's so much less about like what you're saying and more like how you're saying it to make it click. Like yeah. if you can take things that you've learned in life and then distill them down into uh, little micro lessons that, that just make it click. Sometimes this is using analogies. Sometimes this is using visualizations or, for example, like. I'm going to take this interview with you and I'm going to condense it down into a newsletter, into a, a framework that someone can read hopefully in five minutes and, and get some of the good nuggets. Right. Yeah. So, um, okay, really quick, go over, uh, one thing you like about Justin Welsh and his content or his approach. Uh, I know, I know what I like, but I, I want to hear what you like about him. Yeah. So I had a phase where I like deep dived into, into Justin Welsh and I just like obsessed about him. Um, but now I'm kind of like that kind of phase is fading off and I'm getting shiny objects in German other places. Um, but I think the, the one thing that's interesting about Justin Welsh is not really his, like his content is great and it's gone to where he is because it is great. But what I'm more interested in is how his philosophy on uh, lifestyle, on lifestyle design. Yeah. Um, so I know you, you and I, we both kind of um, believe in the philosophy of a company of one, right? 
one man businesses keep it lean mean um but but powerful and use that through high leverage activities so i think if anyone like we could get into like the thick of justin welsh's thought process but if anyone is interested in or wants to optimize their life to be that kind of solopreneur that company of one and still have time to do things that you love outside of business that fulfill you whether it be sports whether it be your hobbies whether it be spending time with people that you love um <clears throat> justin welsh is someone that's really interesting to to study because he is not only making a killing by being a company of one and a digital solopreneur and selling digital products and stuff but it seems like on the back end he lives a pretty a pretty nice lifestyle um, and he can live it on his terms as well, which is really cool. So that's the one thing I love about Justin. Yeah. It's funny. A lot of people I've seen uh, like on Twitter, for example, some people get really triggered by some of the stuff he says, which is, which is very fascinating to me because he's like, I, I, I just, I just don't want to have a job that I don't like. And, you know, yeah. like, I just want to do things that I enjoy and give value and like, what, what is there, what is there to get upset about? But some people, people will get upset about anything. Um, I have personally purchased, I think both of his courses. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was like a no brainer to buy them. And the, what I learned from it was like so valuable. I was like, fuck, I would have paid so much more money for that. But he specifically keeps it at a price point that is accessible for most people. Yeah. Like, um, I, I don't want to say like, dude can do no wrong, but like dude's done so much positive. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, people just find reasons to to hate if they don't fit in a certain box. So, Hey man, um, that's, that's a good sign that you're on the right path if you got haters. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, so real, real quick, one last one. So I know you mentioned Dan Coe and Hayden Smith, but um, I'm actually curious about the uh, about Tom Nosk. I think I think you might have mentioned before that you exchanged some DMs with him at some point. Yeah. Um, he put out a video I think about two months ago that was like, I make content and it's it, it's good, it's decent, whatever. But like, I made this so easy that it's basically impossible for me to fail. Like. I got my systems dialed in. I systemized everything and like it, it's, I, I can shoot these in one day and get them over to the editor and like do this, all, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really challenges the notion of like, it needs to be hard. Things need to be difficult. And I think that's one thing that him and Justin Welsh and maybe uh, even like Dan Coe or Alex Hermosi have in common where it's like, it doesn't need to be difficult. It, it, it kind of goes back to like working smarter versus working harder. But he was, yeah, I, I saw some of the comments. People were not like liking that vibe. He's like, this is not d difficult for me. And that might, <laughs> that might trigger people. Yeah. I'm having fun mm -hmm. and I enjoy it and it's easy and I'm providing value. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about what you vibe with, with, uh, with Tom Nosk. Well, Oh, we'll just get one thing out of the way. His visuals are insane. Like I love, I love yeah. how he grades his stuff. I love how he films. I love how he even gets videographers to help film his everyday life. And I think that's really cool. That's just geeking out over, over video stuff. And he's a filmmaker too. So what I think, I guess for me personally, what resonated with me is that me and Tom had kind of similar paths where he thought that client work was the only way to, to do life as a as a digital entrepreneur or, or service based entrepreneur um, in the creative space at least and uh, he made a shift I can't remember what year he told me but quite recently it's not been that long actually since he's been doing this content stuff he made a shift um, fully into content and he started talking about all that all the freedoms that he's that he's gotten just from building audience showing his authority, sharing his experience, and then selling valuable stuff on the back end. And uh, yeah, that kind of resonated with me because um, at one point I, I was doing a lot of client work that I didn't really enjoy, or I was working with clients that I didn't um, really vibe with. 
And I realized that that was always going to be something you had to deal with as a, as a client, as a client service provider. So he just opened my eyes to this other world of, Hey, you can, you cannot do that if you don't want to. Like if, if you find one day that you're getting work that you don't enjoy or you're working with clients who are not grateful and not, not sticking to your expectations, then you don't have to deal with that because at the end of the day, and people are going to, this is going to rub people the wrong way too, because they might see that I've, you know, built this business and, you know, to some level of success and now I'm complaining about it, but it's just an observation, which is like client work. I wanted to do client work and become, become an entrepreneur because I didn't want to ever have a boss. Yeah. But to some yeah. degree, your client work and at least the projects do become your boss because now you are you are um, not stuck, but you have to deliver on deadlines and certain milestones and you have to deliver on the contract at that point. And at the end of the day, the client has the final say. So to some degree, I do feel that. Right now, I'm really happy. I love all my clients, um, but it's... I think Tom kind of opened my eyes to there's something else there and you can yeah. do it as a regular dude. I did it as a regular dude and I think I just resonated with how he shifted so confidently and I haven't spoken to him a, a ton. Like it was just a couple exchange exchange on DMS, but I've seen some of his stuff and kind of heard his story. And I think, um, yeah, it's just, just kind of inspired me that, that he was able to do it. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't even know if that answers your question, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, that that does. That does. The thing, the thing I like about about Tom and what's very interesting about him is it's like he's just doing what works for him. Like he says that religiously on his on his Instagram is like I'm just doing me, and if you just yeah. do you, you're gonna succeed. Obviously, you have to be aware of certain things and and you know, how the algorithm works and and what people are listening to and and resonating with, but just do you like don't look for your niche but become your own niche which i love about him and um it's really cool how he approaches his content i think at one point he said that his ideal client avatar is not some some you know magic fairy in <laughs> in the netherworld it's literally him when he first started so yeah that makes it, I feel like, uh, personally, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that route, but that's what works for him, and it works really well. So he's just stuck to that. And um, yeah, I just uh, prop, props to Tom. He's, he's doing amazing things. So I'm excited to potentially have more conversations with him and follow his, his journey, as a lot of people are. Yeah, great, man. That's awesome. Uh, give me one. I just have to close this door. No My <laughs> partner just came home. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I am out of questions. You've answered every question like an absolute champ. Uh, I know we are two hours and seven minutes into this, which is uh, part of the course, given our last couple conversations. Yes. Um, I have a couple bonus round questions for you. Mm -hmm. And this, um, I'm more curious about kind of leading off what you just talked about of um, I'll preface this by saying, as someone who had a video business myself, uh, I can attest to what you said about like, you know, it, you, you go on this route to be your own boss. And then all of a sudden you don't just have one boss, you have many bosses and they are your clients. Right. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people can do that for their entire life and love it. And that's great. And that's totally fine. And, um, I would say like, there's no wrong path. If you're an employee, great. Some people love it. That's awesome. Uh, if you own a business where you deal with clients all day, great. Some people love that. That's awesome. Um, but there's this other path that's starting to emerge where um, you don't have one-on-one -on -one clients. You don't have uh, projects that you need to fulfill. You front load the work into something, a product or uh, a digitalized service or a course or something. And then the work after that is um, 
getting eyeballs on the thing. And if the thing is valuable to those people, those people can can buy the thing. So um, some people call this like like passive income. And I don't think that's a great way to describe it, because like if that was the case, then an author of a book is doing passive income. They're not. They they made something. They just monetize over time long term. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. Another example is like Seinfeld makes dope royalties, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, technically, it's passive income, but he had to build that show up over years, like, and a lot of work went into it. So, anyways, point is, there's this other path that's emerging, and it's not really fully defined yet. And there's many different kind of intricacies within this path, and um, that's the path that I'm kind of more curious about. And that's the path that I think, based on our previous conversations, um, you'd like to explore as well. So with as much detail as you're comfortable sharing, um, what, how have you monetized your current audience? And I say this in a business term, like how have you monetized, but like what money have you made from your current audience, if any, and how do you see that changing in the future in a way where I assume you want to provide a lot of value, give a lot of value. Um, What does that look like for you up until now? And what ideally does that look like for you going forward? Yeah, Um, good question. So right now, actually, so it, it kind of, it's kind of interesting because this entire conversation we've been speaking of my client business separately to the content business and my audience but actually there's a little bit of overlap because um after i after i grew on instagram i actually got a lot of leads which is funny it comes full circle at the beginning you think that you're going to post content that generates leads and then you focus on wider wider net and and then that actually generates leads so i'm currently uh, full capacity in terms of client work because of the audience growth. And um, yeah, so I guess monetarily, I'm getting income now because of the content I produce. But now these are long-term contracts. So I mean, like right now, my minimum level of engagement is around 24K over six months. Um, which I think for me is is a great, it's like a sweet spot right now. And next year, I don't know what that'll be. And I know that if I continue my client stuff, which I am planning to, it just depends on how much, um, that that will continue going up. And I could scale that. I could scale on value. I could scale on team. There's a bunch of different ways to scale that. Um, I would probably lean on, on, on value and knowledge. Um, but if I were to make a shift at, at some point, um, I do see myself doing something similar to what Justin Welsh is doing or Tom Nosk is doing. And that's, as you said, kind of productizing my service. Like I think Seth Godin said this one time, it's like productize your service and serviceize your product, right? So like product, I've, I, I've spent a lot of time now servicizing, uh, productizing my service and now I actually have my process and my framework and my system for creating these videos and creating these these video assets and um, creating micro content for myself and for my clients that now it's time for me to think about product, productizing that, that service. So I would think about potentially productizing that and putting that in some sort of um, program, course, cohort-based coaching, something like that, um, whatever kind of... Um, whatever kind of I find myself falling into. And uh, yeah, I guess that's the direction I would go. I don't know where I potentially want to be like monetarily. Like it would be, it would be nice to be doing the numbers that, you know, Tom and Justin are doing. That would be cool. So I guess if I were to put a, put a, a number on it, it would be something around that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, And so, First off, thank you for being candid and uh, and answering this because like it's easy for us to talk about races that we've won or like achievements that we've we've you know got so far. 
it can be a little bit more difficult to talk openly about where we want to go because it's like, well, I haven't gone there yet. So like, I, I don't know what, how far I should, you know, talk about this or what I should say. Um, I think that you and I are alike in the way where the answer that you told me is maybe, uh, maybe a safer answer, but I think you probably have a good idea of where you're going and what it looks like. Um, and I think that's a key part of being able to get there. Like if you can kind of visualize the, the outcome, then you're much more likely to be able to understand the process to get there. Mm. So, um, you, you mentioned that you will still have clients to some degree. It might change what that looks like or what uh, the format is or how many clients or, or what that engagement is like. And I, and I think that's good. Um, if you decided not to have clients, I think that's fine as well. Um, it's more about like what, what works for you. So I'm trying to think of the, the best way to, to ask this. Um, what is, take mon monetary out of it. What is the next thing that you want to understand or conquer or move towards not from like a financial thing but to be able to be like i i did that i kind of like learned that like well, what is interesting to you right now in mm -hmm. terms of like what those next steps yeah i think i see what i think i see where you're going with this like we've talked about this extensively before as well but it's this idea of just like lifestyle design so one thing a lot of people may also resonate with is when you're in the client business, you're in the client business. You are working, you've, you've got like close to regular hours, sometimes over to, you know, keep the lights on. And that doesn't give you much time to do many other things. And there's other ways you can optimize for that, like bringing on and outsourcing and automating and stuff. Um, but yeah, a lot of people will experience that. And that doesn't really align at the moment with what where I want my life to be. And this is gonna get <laughs> this is gonna get super deep. But I mean like we could speak candidly, like I'm right now focusing on optimizing for fulfillment. Yeah. And uh I know you are too. And the two things that kind of fulfill me at the moment are one building things so i like building businesses i like building notion databases when i was a kid i would build legos and build mini skate parks for my my tech decks and stuff like that so building has always been something that's brought me joy and the second thing is being closer to friends and family and having the time to spend with them so in order for me to create that life i have to create a business that serves that so right now just based on what I know and based on the people I've talked to and based on the business models I've seen, the business model of building audience, building brand equity, building authority online and an audience and monetizing off the back of that is the best way for me to live the life that I want, if that makes sense. Because it, yeah. it, affords, me the, it affords me the time as well and it affords me the it's 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 freedom right it's just like financial free, financial freedom time freedom location freedom the thing that everyone wants so um yeah that's that's kind of what i'm going for does that does that answer yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that yeah that's great and um that that's exactly what i was trying to lean into a little bit there um i think this is an important conversation to have because um i think people look sometimes at like influencers or, or something like that. And they're like, ah, they get paid how much to just like post a photo or whatever. And like, I think there's like a, a negative connotation there, but I think the thing a lot of people don't really maybe quite understand about what an influencer does is like, they are able to do that and charge that money because they are able to provide a value to the businesses that they work with in terms of like, introducing them to, to their business and getting them eyeballs and stuff like that. The whole thing falls apart 
as soon as that doesn't work. So like people get mad at the, at the influencer, but it's like, that's the game right? Like don't hit the player, hit the game. So they get mad at these influencers for capitalizing on the fact that they have an audience. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, who, who wouldn't do that? Right. Like, um, yeah, it, it's such a, it's such a weird, it's such a weird thing. Like sometimes people get, um, like a, like a negative connotation around the terms like monetizing an audience. What I've learned so far with my little micro tiny audience that I, I have of uh, virtually nobody for now, um, for now, the, I didn't build my first digital product until I was asked like basically 50 times. <laughs> and, um, the, the first digital product for me was a website template and I built it for myself. And this is something that I, I needed and I just, I did it and I built it. And then people kept asking me, like, where'd you, where'd you get that? Like, can I buy that? I'm like, ah, oh. I did it like <laughs> almost against my will. <laughs> and I put it out there and the reviews were, were positive. And, um, the, the money that came from that was positive as well. And I was like, wait a second. Uh, I went from having a job trading my time for money. And that was, that was good. I was happy with that. I, I was going to like retire basically like that. <laughs> And then I discovered this other way of like, wait, I can trade less of my time and make more money by working for myself. I'm like, wow, that that's great too. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> and then it turned into, wait a second, I can make a decent amount of money by v almost trading no time because I'm selling this thing that I already built that I needed to build for my own purposes. So like it's already done. Like there's no time investment after this besides maybe supporting people. And at first I felt a little weird about it, like a little icky, like maybe I should have gave this away for free type thing. Um, however, there's, there's a point to the story. The reviews that I would get from work, um, like, like being an employee, like doing your yearly review. It's like, okay, you did this well, this well, here's areas from, for improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody was leaving me reviews. Nobody was talking positively about me outside of the, uh, the workplace. Then I started my own business. Okay. Now I'm working with clients one-on-one -on -one, getting better reviews. They're like, you know, they're great. It's positive. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into that. And then this third thing of like, okay, now I'm not putting in as much work, but the value that I'm providing is still there. And instead of working with one client, I'm selling this one thing a hundred times. The reviews that come from that, like the positive things that come from that is on a completely different scale. So um, it's, it's kind of hard. It's kind of weird to think about where this thing that I put in the most amount of time got the least amount of recognition. And then, you know, it's kind of a scale. And then this other thing where like the only way that works is if you're providing real value to someone and they pay for it, but they, they're like, wow, I would have paid way more than that. And then that thing that they get from that, that it allows them to do, in this case, it was like allows their business to scale and it allows them to make money. Well, like that is only successful if many people like buy it and find it and download it, right? So it's kind of this weird thing where like, I thought the further I would go, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a, it hasn't kind of gone the way that I expected it to. Yeah, yeah. And then it evolved into, okay, people were asking me like, okay, I have this website. Like, how do I get traffic to it? How do I, and I was like, oh, okay, well I learned how to do SEO. I, I, I guess I can share that. At first I was giving away everything I knew for free. Like, like four hour live streams in the Facebook group of like, this is how I do SEO. I don't know how else to say it. And then eventually people were like, do you just have like a course where I can go follow like, um, you know, module by module and do it at my own pace. So I don't have to watch a four hour live stream. And I'm like, I gave all the answers away for free. Like it's all there. Like just go, go watch it. But the thing I didn't really understand was like, they're like, well, yeah, but like, I want something more kind of structured where I can just kind of get to the point. So it's not even selling like <laughs> the solution. It's the, the simplification and being able to give them something that they can follow a little bit easier. Yeah. And at every stage of this, it's been a learning experience for me because it challenges everything I thought I knew about work and value. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
it's been, yeah, I would say it's been a challenge for me, but the further I go with this, the more my understanding of work and value gets, gets challenged and like mm-hmm. kind of the deeper I go and the more value I provide and the more reviews, it's, it's a weird thing. It's so, yeah. so hard to talk about and verbalize, but um, I recommend anyone who is an entrepreneur, who is run- running their own business to start to lean into this because it's not some shady thing. It's like a thing where you can provide value at such a greater scale. Mm -hmm. And because you can do that, the value you can extract from it is unlike anything. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's so many things there, but I mean like the first thing that I wanted to respond to on that is like the, the the easiest way to think about this, like you say, a lot of people get shamed because they're monetizing their audience. But if you just look at any of, if anyone just looks at their favorite creators, they're all monetizing their audience in some shape or form. Some may be more overt and more apparent, like selling digital products, for example. Some may be more on the back end, doing brand deals and sponsorships and affiliates and stuff. And I guess people just label this idea of monetizing audience as as negative and and evil but how then how do your favorite creators turn the lights on or keep the lights on like they're already providing so much content and so much value openly and freely and i just don't think it's really um what's the word like i don't think it's virtuous to think that shaming them or or like doing that, the process of doing that is going to make the situation any better because they have to put food on the table. They have to, some me, some people may be a bit more greedy than others, but at the end of the day, all these creators are still putting out free value into the world, um, yeah. which I think a lot of people forget. It's kind of like the, the whole thing about people complaining about YouTube's algorithm, people complaining about oh, this isn't serving me anymore or I'm not getting the views that I want. I've been shadow banned or something. I'm like, dude, you're putting, you're able to put yourself and your ideas on the internet for free and reach millions of people, potentially millions of people for free. Why are you complaining about the algorithm? Why are you complaining about this platform? Like, I think people lose sight of that a little bit. Um, So... Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent agree with you on that. It's it's hard to it's hard to talk about, and like even even now, I'm just like, oh, what words do I use? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might rub people the wrong way, uh, but I think it's important to talk about it because not many people like to talk about it. I think, and so I'm just gonna take a stab here mm, uh, of something that I've noticed based on our, our on our conversation. So when we talked previously about like you potentially monetizing or like what that could look like or what that could be. Um, There was a little bit of like hesitation there on your end of like, well, like, I don't want to, I don't want to like come across as like, I'm I'm just trying to like extract like Mm -hmm. in all this other stuff. The the one thing that I would kind of challenge you on there is um, this is one thing that I didn't expect is that you, you might be making it, more difficult for your audience or your the people to follow you um, because you're not overcoming this challenge of putting something out there and, and giving them something to buy. Have you ever been messaged from someone who's like, oh, like, do you have an affiliate link for this? Or like, do you, I'm like, how can I pay you? Or like anything like that? Like, have you ever re- received messages like that? Yeah, I've gotten like not straight up paying me. I mean, some people have asked for consulting stuff, which I've done in the past, but yeah. very little of. Um, no one's asked me for my, my coffee button <laughs> or anything. Um, but people have asked me quite a lot. Like, do I have a program? Do I have a course? Do I have, do yeah. you have anything else where I can learn more from you? Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, so people are already wanting to, to buy and support, right? Like if you think of, um, like a musician, uh, back before Spotify, like, how would you show your appreciation for them? You, you would buy their album. You would go to their concert, right? Yeah. And by doing that, it allows them to get bigger and better and produce more music. So it's a win-win kind of scenario. But let's say you're the musician in this case. If you are not 
touring or not putting out an album that someone can buy, then you're almost robbing them of the experience of finding their favorite song, mm-hmm. right? Um, of being able to to jam and like be happier because of it. So we we often as creators and, and business people, we we sabotage ourselves either by um, you know thinking these thoughts of like oh, I can't possibly charge for something like that, or even maybe in, in your case of like you see that that is a real future that you could do. You see other people doing it. You understand how the business works. Um, and then you take on so many video clients that you can't even do it right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I did this before with video um, because I was like, well, video is a real job. <laughs> like. Yeah. This is something I can be proud of. This is something that I can I can do, and like it, it's physical and it's hard work, and like I, I understood it, and it was a very difficult challenge for me to overcome that to then focus on growing a photography company where I don't do most of the photos, mm-hmm. and now it's taking me another challenge to overcome that to be like, okay, I'm going to deprioritize that a tiny bit to focus on this other thing that I don't know what is there, and like it feels a little weird, mm-hmm. um, but based on my conversations with you, I kind of see that happening a little bit, and I. I know like you want to go f- into that kind of full force and um, you absolutely have what it takes to do that. And I just, I want to kind of publicly state here that uh, I am team Jerry leaning in that direction wholeheartedly and completely uh, changing his life from it. So um, thank you. I hope that's not too much of an awkward uh, thing to, no, to bring no, up no. and kind of call attention to. But uh, the fact that you have a hundred thousand followers a hundred thousand people in your community and you have not monetized it at all is it is a testament to your integrity it's a it's a testament to like you wanting to when you do launch something you want it to be so valuable that it just like rocks their socks off yeah um i would say i can think of 10 things off the top of my head that are insignificant to you that would knock someone's socks off so uh yeah lean into it keep going Keep appreciate uh, it. I appreciate it, it, man. No, I really appreciate that. Um, I wonder if we have time. I wonder if I could throw back something in your court because this is something yeah. that, and don't get me wrong, I agree with everything you've said so far, and that is top of mind for me for sure. One thing I've been, and I'm sure a lot of creators struggle with, and I've had talks with like uh, some other people in our community about this idea of jab, 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 right hook. And the, the timing and the nuance of that statement, there's, there's so much that goes into that. But there's kind of two schools of thought, I guess, which is Gary Vee's option. And I think a couple of other people, Hermosi, Christo, they're all like, the longer you can give, the bigger the ask can be at the end. Whereas I know some other people in the industry think the other way is ask ask as much as you can with integrity and ask but still provide on the value. But it's not black and white. Like you don't have to give, 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 give and then wait forever to ask as long as possible. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on that statement as a whole. Like, what do you yeah. think about Hormozy saying, if you can delay gratification as long as humanly possible, your reward will be greater at the end of the at the end of the tunnel, versus some people saying, you might as well ask now while you can. Yeah, this is a good question. This is a this is a great question actually. So, the way that I look at that jab 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 right hook is i think it's valid i think it's very real i think it's yeah i think it's the the science checks out Mm. the thing that i would push back on with that is like um both gary v and alex hormozy have other things that make money so they can continuously jab until they're 90 years old and then they can do a right hook right so um, Gary Vee has like a marketing agency alex hormozy is just like a great business person so one they can delay that Right. But two, Gary Vee and Alex Hormozy are two of the biggest creators out there. And 
I think for their strategy of being the biggest or being the best, I think that might work for them. I think that might make sense. The thing that I would push back on is what is like, what is your end goal? Like, do you, do you want to be a Hormozy or a Gary Vee? Because if so, maybe that is the right strategy to follow. Or do you want to take the path where, um, maybe you're not that size, maybe you're not that level, but you get to wake up every day and kind of do the things that you like doing and enjoy and live a simple life. Like Alex Hormozy is not an, an essentialist. <laughs> Gary V is not an essentialist, right? Yeah. So I think what they say makes sense. I think the strategy is sound for that person that wants to go that path. Uh, but I also think that there's a very real path where you can still jab, jab, jab. Like, dude, you've jabbed like... <laughs> so much already yeah. um, where you can jab and throw some right hooks in and keep jabbing and throw some right hooks so that you can live a sustainable life for you and one that you enjoy. Um, I don't think either one is, is the right decision. Yeah. Um, I think it, it more depends on what, yeah, what your goals are and like how sustainable uh, you can make this. Let's say you keep making Instagram videos and you keep doing client work, right? You, you might come into this like, cycle where you take on a little bit too many clients and then you can't make content and then you got to like wait for that to pass. And then you're doing this so that you're delaying doing the right hook. Right. And because of that, now your followers aren't seeing your stuff. They're not hearing from you. They're not getting the value. So in your attempt to do that, you're kind of sabotaging it in a way mm -hmm. where <laughs> if you were just to throw in a little right hook, that might be enough for you to just focus on jabbing continuously for the, you know, for the foreseeable future. So yeah. I think it, I think it's a tough question to, to answer, yeah, no, but um, sure. does that make sense? Yeah, no, I just wanted to hear your opinion on it. Um, yeah. And that just, that makes a lot of sense and I see it. And I, as you said, like, there's no right or wrong. It's just interesting to kind of marinate on these ideas, right? Because it, it I guess it does the big thing it, is it does matter what you're optimizing for and being self-aware yes. about that stuff. Um, so yeah, for sure. I mean, when you're pumping me up, like <laughs> tomorrow, yeah, like, link in bio, <laughs> like, subscribe, like, follow. If I could maybe illustrate this, yeah. like, have you, have you seen Gary Vee? <laughs> the I dude looks him? like, yeah. he, have you seen him? <laughs> This is not to throw shade, but like the dude could use a nap. He is go, 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 go. But he is also, he loves it. Yeah. That is how he wants to live. That is how he, he, he wants his, his existence to be. He could retire if he wants to, but this is the thing that fires him up. And that's not that that's totally okay for him. This is where I think the, you know, things like essentialism and like kind of the pushback on um, grinding is really valuable because like that is not the only way. You don't just have to give, 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 and never take anything back. Yeah. Uh, that That's fine. But like being true to being open and honest about what you want to get out of it and then optimizing for that, I think is the right way to go. So yeah, 100%, man. Yeah. I agree. I agree on all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Jerry, it's been it's been two hours and thirty seven minutes, yeah. which again uh, I, I, I've mentioned this a couple <laughs> times, but um, yeah, w when it's just me and you on these calls, I think we spend roughly the same amount of time, if not more. Yeah. Uh, but for the sake of someone listening to this and uh, having to go through it all, I should probably wrap it up. Is there anything that you wanted to kind of add in here before we sign off? Is there any kind of last remarks that you wanted to to add in or? Um... I guess the only thing is just like, thank you, man. Like, I appreciate you and your mindset, your thought process, your voice that you put into the creator community on all these things. Like, for anyone watching, Justin is a perfect example of how to approach this world in the way that he gives openly. He jab, 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 right hook occasionally. And his, you know, like, his thought process is something that anyone could really take a lot of valuable gems away from. And that's why we resonated from in the first place. Like we, we see eye to eye on a lot of things. 
Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you for for shipping your work and and uh, putting out all the things that you're currently putting out for our community. So um, and thank you for having me on too. So that's, that'll be yeah, it. dude. It was it was yeah. Honestly, it was my pleasure. Whenever we whenever we have these calls, we're like ah, that was so valuable for me. Like I almost feel like I need to give back to you because of how much I get out of it. And I, I think it, it's it's kind of like that reciprocated thing. So um, I want to say like the, the, yeah, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you for being um, so gracious to come on here and chat about all things business and be, and to, to honestly like be candid about your business and talk about things that maybe are a little uncomfortable or uh, yeah, I think that's how we kind of move forward in, in this kind of stuff. And uh, I really appreciate you taking your time. So, no, um, dude, it's been a slice. I, uh, I will let you get back to your day and uh yeah thank you for joining thank you thanks man have a good one yeah for sure <laughs>